Oh, hello. I was just reading the selected short stories of Franz Kafka. You'd like to hear some? Well, I don't usually read a lot. All right, if you insist. But just one. A common confusion. A common experience resulting in a common confusion. A has to transact important business with B in H. He goes to H for a preliminary interview, accomplishes the journey there in 10 minutes, and the journey back in the same time, and on returning, boasts to his family of his expedition. Next day, he goes again to H, this time to settle his business finally. As that by all appearances will require several hours, A leaves very early in the morning. But although the accessory circumstances, at least in A's estimation, are exactly the same as the day before, it takes him ten hours this time to reach H. When he arrives there, quite exhausted, in the evening, he is informed that B, annoyed at his absence, had left half an hour before to go to A's village, and that they must have passed each other on the road. A is advised to wait. But in his anxiety about his business, he sets off at once and hurries home. This time he achieves the journey, without paying any particular attention to the fact exactly in a second. At home he learns that B had arrived quite early, immediately after A's departure, indeed that he had met A on the threshold and reminded him of his business. But A had replied that he had no time to spare. He must go at once. In spite of this incomprehensible behavior of A, however, B had stayed on to wait for A's return. It is true, he had asked several times whether A was not yet back, but he was still sitting up in A's room. Overjoyed at the opportunity of seeing B at once and explaining everything to him, <clears throat> A rushes upstairs. He is almost at the top when he stumbles twists a sinew, and almost fainting with pain, incapable even of uttering a cry, only able to moan faintly in the darkness, he hears B, impossible to tell whether at a great distance or quite near him, stamping down the stairs in a violent rage and vanishing for good. That was a common confusion. What a fitting title to something that makes so little sense. And I think all of us have that in common, that, that we heard that and, and are a bit confused. Um, let's try the next one, huh? The New Advocate. Benjamin Jones is my advocate, but he's nothing new. We have a new advocate, Dr. Bucephalus. There is little in his appearance to remind you that he was once Alexander of Macedon's battle charger. Of course, if you know his story, you are aware of something. But even a simple usher whom I saw the other day on the front steps of the law courts, a man with the professional appraisal of the regular small punter in a race, in a race course, <laughs> was punching and admire was, was running an admiring eye over the advocate as he mounted the marble steps with a high action that made them ring beneath his feet. In general, the bar approves the admission of Bucephalus. With astonishing insight, people tell themselves that modern society being what it is, Bucephalus is in a difficult position, and therefore, considering also his importance in the history of the world, he deserves at least a friendly reception. Nowadays, it cannot be denied, there is no Alexander the Great. There are plenty of men who know how to murder people. The skill needed to reach over a banqueting table and pink a friend with a lance is not lacking, and for many, Macedonia is too confining so that they curse Philip, the father, but no one, no one at all, can blaze a trail to India. Even in his day, the gates of India were beyond reach, yet the king's sword pointed the way to them. Today the gates have receded to remoter and loftier places. No one points the way. Many carry swords, but only to brandish them, and the eye that tries to follow them is confused. So perhaps 
it is really best to do as Bucephalus has done, and absorb oneself in law books. In the quiet lamplight, his flanks unhampered by the thighs of a rider, free and far from the clamor of battle, he reads and turns the pages of our ancient tomes. Well, someone who's once a soldier is no longer and reads a book, I guess, is the story. Uh, I was never a soldier. I am reading a book. I've got soul. I don't. I don't have any soul. But I'm not a soldier, was the point. I don't have a soul, and I'm not a soldier, would be my version of the song. An old manuscript. Another short story of Franz Kafka. It's been selected, so you know it's good. An old manuscript. It looks as if much had been neglected in our country's system of defense. We have not concerned our we have not concerned ourselves with it until now and have gone about our daily work, but things that have been happening recently begin to trouble us. I have a cobbler's workshop in the square that lies before the emperor's palace. Scarcely have I taken my shutters down at the first glimmer of dawn when I see armed soldiers already posted in the mouth of every street opening on the square. But these soldiers are not ours. They are obviously nomads from the north. In some way that is incomprehensible to me, they have pushed right into the capital, although it is a long way from the frontier. At any rate, here they are. It seems that every morning there are more of them. As is their nature, they camp under the open sky, for they abominate dwelling houses. They busy themselves, sharpening swords, whittling arrows, and practicing horsemanship. This peaceful square, which always kept so scrupulously clean, they have made literally into a stable. We do try every now and then to run out of our shops and clear away at least the worst of the filth, but this happens less and less often, for the labor is in vain and brings us besides into danger of falling under the hooves of the wild horses or being crippled with lashes from the whips. Speech with the nomads is impossible. They do not know our language. Indeed, they hardly have a language of their own. They communicate with each other much as jackdaws do. A screeching as of jackdaws is always in our ears. Our way of living in our institutions, they neither understand nor care to understand. And so they are unwilling to make sense even out of our sign language. You can gesture at them till you dislocate your jaws and your wrists and still they will not have understood you and will never understand. They often make grimaces, uh, then the whites of their eyes turn up and foam gathers on their lips, but they do not mean anything by that, not even a threat. They do it because it is their nature to do it. Whatever they need, they take. You cannot call it taking by force. They grab at something and you simply stand aside and leave them to it. For my stock too, they have taken many good articles, but I cannot complain when I see how the butcher, for instance, suffers across the street. As soon as he brings any as soon as he brings in any meat, the nomad snatch it away from him and gobble it up. Even their horses devour flesh. Often enough a horseman and his horse are lying side by side, both of them gnawing at the same joint, uh, one at either end. The butcher is nervous and does not dare stop his deliveries of meat. We understand that, however, and subscribe money to keep him going. If the nomads got no meat, who knows what they might think of doing? Who knows anyhow what they may think of, even though they get meat every day? Not long ago, the butcher thought he might at least spare himself the trouble of slaughtering, and so one morning he, bought, he brought along a live ox, but he will never dare to do that again. I lay for a whole hour flat on the floor at the back of my workshop with my head muffled in all the clothes and rugs and pillows I had, simply to keep from hearing the bellowing of that ox, which the nomads were leaping on from all sides, tearing morsels out of its living flesh with their teeth. It had been quiet for a long time before I risked coming out. They were lying overcome round the remains of the carcass like drunkards round a wine cask. This was the occasion when I fancied I actually saw the emperor himself at a window of the palace. Usually he never enters these outer rooms, but spends all his time in the innermost garden. Yet on this occasion he was standing, or so at least it seemed to me, at one of the windows, watching with bent head the goings-on before his residence. What is going to happen, we all ask ourselves. How long can we endure this burden and torment? The emperor's palace has drawn the nomads here, but 
does not know how to drive them away again. The gate stays shut. The guards, who used to be always marching out and in with ceremony, keep close behind barred windows. It is left to us artisans and tradesmen to save our country. But we are not equal to such a task, nor have we ever claimed to be capable of it. This misunderstanding of some kind, it will be the ruin of us. Strange. Uh, the next one's called a fratricide, which I believe is when a brother kills a brother. Fratricide. If you're just tuning in, this is Selected Stories of Franz Kafka. The evidence shows that this is how the murder was committed. What a beginning. Schmar, the murderer, took up his post about nine o'clock one night in clear moonlight by the corner where Weiss, his victim, had to turn from the street where his office was into the street he lived in. The night air was shivering cold, yet Schmar was wearing only a thin blue suit. The jacket was unbuttoned, too. He felt no cold. Besides, he was moving about all the time. His weapon, half a bayonet and half a kitchen knife, he kept firmly in his grasp, quite naked. He looked at the knife against the light of the moon. The blade glittered. Not enough for Schmar. He struck it against the bricks of the pavement till the sparks flew, regretted that, perhaps, and to repair the damage, drew it like a violin bow across his boot sole, while he bent forward, standing on one leg, and listened both to the whetting of the knife on his boot, and for any sound, out of the fateful side street. Why did Pallas, the private citizen who was watching it all from his window nearby in the second story, permit it to happen? Unriddle the mysteries of human nature! Exclamation point. With his collar turned up, his dressing gown girt round his portly body, he stood looking down, shaking his head. And five houses farther along, on the opposite side of the street, Mrs. Wheeze, with a fox fur coat over her nightgown, peered out to look for her husband, who was lingering unusually late tonight. At last, there rang out the sound of a doorbell before Weez's office, too loud for a doorbell right over the town and up to heaven. And Weez, the industrious night worker, issued from the building, still invisible in that street, only heralded by the sound of the bell. At once, the pavement registered his quiet footsteps. Pallas bent forward, bent far forward. He dared not miss anything. Mrs. Weez, Reassured by the bell, shut her window with a clatter. But Schmar knelt down. Since he had no other parts of his body bare, he pressed only his face and his hands against the pavement. Where everything else was freezing, Schmar was glowing hot. At the very corner dividing the two streets, Weiss paused. Only his walking stick came round into the other street to support him. A sudden whim the night sky invited him, with its dark blue and its gold. Unknowing, he gazed up at it. Unknowing, he lifted his hat and stroked his hair. Nothing up there drew together in a pattern to interpret the immediate future for him. Everything stayed in its senseless, inscrutable place. In itself, it was a highly reasonable action that we should walk on, but he walked up to Schmar's knife. Weiss, shrieked Schmar, standing on tiptoe, his arm outstretched, the knife sharply lowered. Weiss, you will never see Julia again. And right into the throat, and left into the throat, and a third time deep into the belly stabbed Schmar's knife. Water rats slid open, give out such a sound as came from Weiss. Done, said Schmar, and pitched the knife, now superfluous blood-stained ballast, against the nearest house front. The bliss of murder!
the relief, the soaring ecstasy from the shedding of another's blood. Weiss, old night bird, friend, alehouse crony, you are oozing away into the dark earth below the street. Why aren't you simply a bladder of blood so that I could stamp on you and make you vanish into nothingness? Not all we want comes true. Not all the dreams that are blossomed have borne fruit. Your solid remains lie here, already indifferent to every kick. What's the good of the dumb question you are asking? Pallas, choking on the poison in his body, stood at the double-leafed door of his house as it flew open. Shmar! Shmar! I saw it all! I missed nothing! Pallas and Shmar scrutinized each other. The result of the scrutiny satisfied Pallas. Shmar came to no conclusion. Mrs. Weiss, with a crowd of people on either side, came rushing up, her face grown quite cold with the shock. Her fur coat swung open. She collapsed on top of Weiss. The nightgowned body belonged to Weiss, the fur coat spreading over the couple like the smooth turf of a grave belonged to the crowd. Schmar, fighting down with difficulty the last of his nausea, pressed his mouth against the shoulder of the policeman, who, stepping lightly, led him away. And that's it. <laughs> A fratricide. So Schmar and Weiss were brothers, and Pallas was poisoning himself? Sounds like Pallas was in on the murder and wanted to see it happen and then also died. I don't know. I don't know. It is not clear. Here's another uh, selected short story of Franz Kafka. A report to an academy. Honored members of the academy. You have done me the honor of inviting me to give your academy an account of the life I formerly led as an ape. I regret that I cannot comply with your request to the extent you desire. It is now nearly five years since I was an ape, a short space of time perhaps according to the calendar, but an indefinitely long time to gallop through at full speed, as I have done, more or less accompanied by excellent mentors, good advice, applause, and orchestral music, and yet essentially alone. Since all my escorters to keep the image kept well off the course. I could never have achieved what I have done had I been stubbornly set on clinging to my origins, to the remembrances of my youth. In fact, to give up being stubborn was the supreme commandment I laid upon myself. Free ape as I was, I submitted myself to that yoke. In revenge, however, my memory of the past has closed the door against me more and more. I could have returned at first had human beings allowed it, through an archway as wide as the span of heaven over the earth. But as I spurred myself on in my forced career, the opening narrowed and shrank behind me. I felt more comfortable in the world of men and fitted it better. The strong wind that blew after me out of my past began to slacken. Today, it is only a gentle puff of air that plays around my heels. And the opening in the distance through which it comes and through which I once came myself, has grown so small that even if my strength and my willpower suffice to get me back to it, I should have to scrape the very skin from my body to crawl through. To put it plainly, much as I like expressing myself in images, to put it plainly, your life lies behind you, cannot be farther removed from you than mine is from me, yet everyone on earth feels a tickling at the heels, the small chimpanzee and the great Achilles alike. But, to a lesser extent, I can perhaps meet your demand, and indeed I do so with the greatest pleasure. The first thing I learned was to get a handshake. A handshake betokens frankness. Well, today, now that I stand at the very peak of my career, I hope to add frankness in words to the frankness of that first handshake. What I have to tell the Academy will contribute nothing essentially new, and will fall far behind what you have asked of me, and... What with the best will in the world, I cannot communicate. Nonetheless, it should indicate the line an erstwhile ape has had to follow in entering and establishing himself in the world of men. Yet I could not risk putting into words even such insignificant information as I am going to give you if I were not quite sure of myself 
and if my position on all the great variety stages of the civilized world had not been become quite unassailable. <clears throat> I belong to the Gold Coast. For the story of my capture, I must depend on the evidence of others, a hunting expedition sent out by the firm of Hagenbeck. By the way, I have drunk many a bottle of good red wine since then with the leader of that expedition, had taken up its position in the bushes by the shore. When I came down for a drink at evening among a troop of apes, they shot at us. I was the only one that was hit. I was hit in two places, once in the cheek, a slight wound, but I left a large naked red scar, which earned me the name of Red Peter. A horrible name, utterly inappropriate, which only some ape could have thought of, as if the only difference between me and the performing ape Peter, who died not so long ago and had some small local reputation, were the red mark on my cheek. This, by the way. The second shot hit me below the hip. It was a severe wound. It is the cause of my limping a little to this day. I read an article recently by one of the 10,000 windbags who vent themselves concerning me in the newspaper saying my ape nature is not yet quite under control. The proof of being that when visitors come to see me, I have a predilection for taking down my tr trousers to show them where the shot went in. The hand which wrote that should have its fingers shot away one by one. As for me, I can take my trousers down before anyone if I'd like. You would find nothing but a well-groomed fur, and the scar made, let me be particular in the choice of a word for this particular purpose, to avoid misunderstanding, the scar made by a wanton shot. Everything is open, and above board, there is nothing to conceal. When the plain truth is in question, great minds discard the niceties of refinement. Of refinement. But if the writer of the article were to take down his trousers before a visitor, that would be quite another story, and I will let it stand to his credit that he does not do it. In return, let him leave me alone with his delicacy. After these two shots, I came to myself, and this is where my own memories gradually begin. Between decks, in the Hagenbach steamer, inside a cage. It was not a four-sided barred cage, it was only a three-sided cage nailed to a locker. The locker made the fourth side of it. The whole construction was too low for me to stand up in, too narrow to sit down in, so I had to squat with my knees bent and trembling all the time, and so, since probably for a time I wished to see no one and to stay in the dark, my face was turned towards the locker, while the bars of the cage cut into my flesh behind. Such a method of confining wild beasts is supposed to have its advantages during the first days of captivity. And out of my own experiences, I cannot deny that from the human point of view, this is really the case. But that did not occur to me then. For the first time in my life, I could see no way out, at least no direct way out. Directly in front of me was the locker, board fitted close to board. True, there was a gap running right through the boards where I greeted, where I, which I greeted with the blissful howl of ignorance when I first discovered it. But the hole was not even wide enough to stick one's tail to stick one's tail through, and not all the strength of an ape could enlarge it. I am supposed to have made uncommonly little noise, as I was later informed, from which the conclusion was drawn that I would either soon die, or if I, ma if I managed to survive, the first critical period would be very amenable to training. I did survive this period, hopelessly sobbing, painfully hunting for fleas, apathetically licking a coconut, beating my skull against the locker, sticking out my tongue at anyone who came near me. That was how I filled in time at first in my new life. But over and above it all, only the one feeling, no way out. Of course, what I felt then as an ape, I can represent now only in human terms, and therefore I misrepresent it. But although I cannot reach back to the truth of the old ape life, there is no doubt that it lies somewhere in the direction I have indicated. Until then, I had had so many ways out of everything, and now I had none. I was pinned down. Had I been nailed down, my right to free movement would not have been lessened. Why so? Scratch your flesh raw between your toes, but you won't find the answer. Press yourself against the bar behind you till it nearly cuts you in two. You won't find the answer. I had no way out, but I had to devise one. For with it, without it, I could not live. All the time facing that locker, I should certainly have perished. Yet as far as Hagenbach, Hagenbeck was concerned, 
The place for apes was in front of a locker. Well, then, I had to stop being an ape. A fine, clear train of thought, which I must have constructed somehow with my belly, since apes think with their bellies. I fear that perhaps you do not quite understand what I mean by way out. I use the expression in its fullest and most popular sense. I deliberately do not use the word freedom. I do not mean the spacious feeling of freedom on all sides. As an ape, perhaps I knew that. And I have met men who yearn for it, but for my part, I desired such freedom neither then nor, the, nor now. In passing, may I say that all too often men are betrayed by the word freedom? And as freedom is counted among the most sublime feelings, so the corresponding disillusionment can be also sublime. In variety theaters, I have often watched before my turn came on a couple of acrobats performing on trapezes high in the roof. They swung themselves, they rocked to and fro, they sprang into the air, they floated into each other's arms, one hung by the hair from the teeth of another, and all that, all that too is human, freedom, I thought, self-controlled movement, what a mockery of holy mother nature. Were the apes to see such a spectacle, no theater walls would stand the shock of their laughter. No, freedom was not what I wanted, only a way out, right or left or in any direction. I made no other demand, <clears throat> even should the way out prove to be an illusion. The demand was a small one. The disappointment could be no bigger. To get out somewhere, to get out, only not to stay motionless with raised arms crushed against a wooden wall. Today, I can see it clearly. Without the most profound inward calm, I could never have found my way out. And indeed, perhaps I owe all that I have become to the calm that settled within me after my first few days in the ship. And again, for that calmness, it was the ship's crew I had to thank. They were good creatures in spite of everything. I find it still pleasant to remember the sound of their heavy footfalls, which used to echo through my half-dreaming head. They had a habit of doing everything as slowly as possible. If one of them wanted to rub his eyes, he lifted a hand as if it were a drooping weight. Their jests were coarse but hearty. Their laughter had <clears throat> always a gruff bark in it that sounded dangerous but meant nothing. They always had something in their mouths to spit out and did not care where they spat it. They always grumbled that they got fleas from me, yet they were not seriously angry about it. They knew that my fur fostered fleas and that fleas jump. It was a simple matter of fact to them. When they were off duty, some of them often used to sit down in a semicircle around me. They hardly spoke but only grunted to each other, smoked their pipes, stretched out on lockers, smacked their knees as soon as I made the slightest movement. And now and then, one of them would take a stick and tickle me where I liked being tickled. If I were to be invited today to take a cruise on that ship, I should certainly refuse the invitation, but just as certainly the memories I could recall between its decks would not all be hateful. The calmness I acquired among these people kept me above all from trying to escape as I look back now, it seems to me I must have had at least an inkling that I had to find a way out or die. But that my way out could not be reached through flight. I cannot tell how whether escape was possible. I cannot tell now whether escape was possible, but I believe it must have been. For an ape, it must always be possible. With my teeth as they are today, I have to be careful even in simply cracking nuts, but at that time I could certainly have managed by degrees to bite through the lock of my cage. I did not do it. What good would it have done me? As soon as I had poked out my head, I should have been caught again and put in a worse cage, or I might have been slipped among the other animals without being noticed, among the pythons, say, who were opposite me and so breathed out my life in their embrace, or, supposing I had actually succeeded in sneaking out as far as the deck and leaping overboard, I should have rocked for a little on the deep sea and then been drowned. Desperate remedies. I did not think it out in this human way, but under the influence of my surroundings, I acted as if I had thought it out. I did not think things out, but I observed everything quietly. I watched these men go to and fro, always the same faces, the same movements. Often it seemed to me there was only the same man. So this man or these men walked about unimpeded, a lofty goal faintly dawned before me. No one promised me that if I became like them, the bars of my cage would be taken away. Such promises are, for apparently impossible contingencies, are not given. But if one achieves the impossible, 
The promises appear later retrospectively, precisely where one had looked in vain for them before. Now, these men in themselves had no great attraction for me. Had I been devoted to the aforementioned idea of freedom, I should certainly have preferred the deep sea to the way out that suggested itself in the heavy faces of these men. At any rate, I watched them for a long time before I even thought of such things. Indeed, it was only the mass weight of my observations that impelled me in the right direction. It was so easy to imitate these people. I learned to spit in the very first days. We used to spit in each other's faces. The only difference was that I licked my face clean afterwards, and they did not. I could soon smoke a pipe like an old hand, and if I also pressed my thumb into the bowl of the pipe, a roar of appreciation went up between decks. Only it took me a very long time to understand the difference between a full pipe and an empty one. My worst trouble came from the schnapps bottle. The smell of it revolted me. I forced myself to it as best I could, but it took weeks for me to master my repulsion. This inward conflict, strangely enough, was taken more seriously by the crew than anything else about me. I cannot distinguish the men from each other in my recollection, but there was one of them who came again and again alone or with friends by day, by night, at all kinds of hours. He would post himself before me with the bottle and give me instructions. He could not understand me. He wanted to solve the enigma of my being. He would slowly uncork the bottle and then look at me to see if I had followed him. I admit that I always watched him with wildly eager, too eager attention. Such a student of humankind, no human teacher ever found on earth. After the bottle was uncorked, he lifted it to his mouth. I followed it with my eyes right up to his jaws. He would nod, pleased with me, and set the bottle to his lips. I, enchanted with my gradual enlightenment, squealed and scratched myself comprehensively whenever wherever scratching was called for he rejoiced tilted the bottle and took a drink i impatient and desperate to emulate him befouled myself in my cage which again gave him great satisfaction and then holding the bottle at an arm's length and bringing it up with a swing he would empty it at one draft leaning back at an exaggerated angle for my better instruction i exhausted by too much effort could follow him no further and hung limply to the bars while he ended his theoretical exposition by rubbing his belly and grinning. After theory came practice. Was I not already quite exhausted by my theoretical instruction? Indeed I was, utterly exhausted. That was part of my destiny. And yet, I would take hold of the proffered bottle as well as I was able, uncork it, trembling. This successful action would gradually inspire me with new energy. I would lift the bottle, already following my original model almost exactly, put it to my lips, and and then throw it down in disgust, utter disgust, although it was empty and filled only with the smell of the spirit, throw it down on the floor in disgust to the sorrow of my teacher, to the greater sorrow of myself, neither of us being really comforted by the fact that I did not forget, even though I had thrown away the bottle, to rub my belly most admirably and to grin. Far too often my lesson ended in that way, and to the credit of my teacher, he was not angry. Sometimes, indeed, he would hold his burning pipe against my fur until it began to smolder, and in some places I could not easily reach. But then he would himself extinguish it with his own kind, enormous hand, with his own kind, enormous hand. He was not angry with me. He perceived that we were both fighting on the same side against the nature of apes, and that I had the more difficult task. What is going on? What a triumph it was, then, both for him and for me, when one evening, before a large circle of spectators, perhaps there was a celebration of some kind, a gramophone was playing, an officer was circulating among the crew. When on this evening, just as no one was looking, I took hold of a schnapps bottle that had been carelessly left standing before my cage, uncorked it in the best style, while the company began to watch me with mounting attention, set it to my lips without hesitation, with no grimace, like a professional drinker, with rolling eyes and full throat, actually and truly drank it empty, then threw the bottle away, not this time in despair, but as an artistic performer. Forgot indeed to rub my belly, but instead of that, because I could not help it, because my senses were reeling, called a brief and unmistakable hallow, breaking into human speech. And with this outburst, broke into the human community and felt its echo. Listen, he's talking, like a caress over the whole of my sweat-drenched body. I repeat, there was no attraction for me in imitating human beings. I imitated them because I needed a way out and for no other reason. And even that triumph of mine did not achieve much. I lost my human voice again at once. It did not come back for months. 
my aversion for the schnapps bottle returned again with even greater force. But the line I was to follow had in any case been decided once for all. When I was handed over to my first trainer in Hamburg, I soon realized that there were two alternatives before me, the zoological gardens or the variety stage. I did not hesitate. I said to myself, do your utmost to get on to the variety stage. The zoological gardens means only a new cage. Once there, you are done for. And so I learned things, gentlemen. Ah, one learns when one has to. One learns when one needs a way out. One learns at all costs. One stands over oneself with a whip. One flays oneself at the slightest op opposition. My ape nature fled out of me, head over heels and away, so that my first teacher was almost himself turned into an ape by it. I'd soon to give up teaching and was taken away to a mental hospital. Fortunately, he was soon let out again. But I used up many teachers, indeed, several teachers at once. As I became more confident of my abilities, as the public took an interest in my progress and my future began to look bright, I engaged teachers for myself, established them in five communicating rooms, and took lessons from them all at once by dint of leaping from one room to the other. That progress of mine, how the rays of knowledge penetrated from all sides into my awakening brain, I do not deny it. I found it exhilarating, but I must also confess I did not overestimate it, not even then, much less now. With an effort which up till now has never been repeated, I managed to reach the cultural level of an average European. Good Lord. It's laying it on thick, huh? In itself, that might be nothing to speak of, but it is something insofar as it has helped me out of my cage and opened a special way out for me. The way of humanity. There is an excellent idiom to fight one's way through the thick of things. That is what I have done. I have fought through the thick of things. There was nothing else for me to do, provided always that freedom was not to be my choice. As I look back over my development and survey what I have achieved so far, I do not complain, but I am not complacent either. With my hands in my trousers, pockets, my bottle of wine on the table, I half lie and half sit in my rocking chair and gaze out of the window. If a visitor arrives, I receive him with propriety. My manager sits in the anteroom. When I ring, he comes and listens to what I have to say. Nearly every evening, I give a performance, and I have a success, which could hardly be increased. When I come home late at night from banquets, from scientific receptions, from social gatherings, there sits waiting for me a half-trained little chimpanzee, and I take comfort from her as apes do. By day, that's just too weird, right? That's too weird. By day, I cannot bear to see her for she has the insane look of the bewildered, half-broken animal in her eye. No one else sees it, but I do, and I cannot bear it. On the whole, at any rate, I have achieved what I set out to achieve, but do not tell me that it was not worth the trouble. In any case, I am not appealing for any man's verdict. I am only imparting knowledge. I am only making a report. To you also, honored members of the Academy, I have only made a report. Uh, that was a story by Franz Kafka, but it made me uncomfortable in the middle. I just feel like he's telling the story of a, a well, a, a large ape who, who gets consciousness after he's stolen on a boat, and it just feels a little bit um, gross. Well-intentioned, it looks like, but who am I to say anything of that nature? Uh, the Hunter Gracchus is the name of the next one. Grokus, perhaps? Let's call him Grokus. Got to wet the whistle. <clears throat> the Hunter Grokus. Two boys were sitting on the harbor wall, playing with dice. A man was reading a newspaper on the steps of the monument, resting in the shadow of a hero who was flourishing his sword on high. Flourishing his sword on high. He had it set on high. A girl was filling her bucket at the fountain. A fruit seller was lying beside his scales, staring out to sea. Through the vacant window and door openings of a cafe, one could see two men quite at the back drinking their wine. The proprietor was sitting at a table in front and dozing. A bark was silently making for the little harbor, as if borne by invisible means over the water. A man in a blue blouse climbed ashore and drew the rope toward the ring, through the ring. Drew the rope through a ring. Behind the boatman, two other men in dark coats with silver buttons carried a beer on which, beneath a great flower-patterned tasseled silk cloth, a man was 
apparently lying. Nobody on the quay troubled about the newcomers, not even when they lowered to the beer. They lowered the beer to wait for the boatman, who was still occupied with his rope. Nobody went nearer. Nobody asked them a question. Nobody accorded them an inquisitive glance. The pilot was still further detained by a woman who, a child at her breast, now appeared with loosened hair on the deck of the boat. Then he advanced and indicated a yellowish two-storied house that rose abruptly on the left side, on the left, beside the sea. The bearers took up their burden and bore it to the low but gracefully pillared door. A little boy opened a window just in time to see the party vanishing into the house, then hastily shut the window again. The door was now shut. It was of black oak and very strongly made. A flock of doves, which had been flying round the belfry, alighted in the street before the house. As if their food were stored within, they assembled in front of the door. One of them flew up to the first story and pecked at the window pane. They were bright-hued, well-tended, beautiful birds. The woman on the boat flung grain to them in a wide sweep. They ate it up and flew across to the woman. A man in a top hat, tied with a band of crepe, now descended one of the narrow and very steep lanes that led to the harbor. He glanced round vigilantly. Everything seemed to displease him. His mouth twisted at the sight of some awful in a corner. Fruit skins were lying on the steps of the monument. He swept them off in passing with his stick. He rapped at the house door, at the same time taking his top hat from his head with his black gloved hand. The door was opened at once, and some fifty little boys appeared in two rows in the long entry hall and bowed to him. The boatman descended the stairs, greeted the gentleman in black, conducted him up to the first story, led him round the bright and elegant logia which encircled the courtyard, and both of them entered, while the boys pressed after them at a respectful distance, a cool, spacious room looking towards the back, from whose window no habitation but only a bare blackish gray rocky wall was to was to be seen <laughs> the bearers were bruised uh, i'm sorry the bearers were busied in setting up and lighting several long candles at the head of the bier yet these did not give light but only scared away the shadows which had been immobile till then and made them flicker over the walls the cloth covering the bier had been thrown back lying on it was a man with wildly matted hair who looked somewhat like a hunter. He lay without motion and, it seemed, without breathing, his eyes closed, yet only his trappings indicated that this man was probably dead. The gentleman stepped up to the bier, laid his hand upon the brow of the man lying upon it, then kneeled down and prayed. The boatman made a sign to the bearers to leave the room. They went out, drove away the boys who had gathered outside, and shut the door. But even that did not seem to satisfy the gentleman. He glanced at the boatman. The boatman understood and vanished through a side door into the next room. At once the man on the bier opened his eyes, turned his face painfully towards the gentleman, and said, Who are you? Without any mark of surprise, the gentleman rose from his kneeling posture and answered, The Burgomaster of Riva. The man on the bier nodded, indicated a chair with a feeble movement of his arm, and said, after the burgomaster had accepted his invitation, I knew that, of course, burgomaster, but in the first moments of returning consciousness, I always forget, everything goes round before my eyes, and it is best to ask about anything, even if I know. You too probably know that I am the hunter of Gracchus. Certainly, said the burgomaster. Your arrival was announced to me during the night. We had been asleep. For a good while, then towards midnight, my wife cried, Salvatore, that's my name, look at the dove at the window. It was really a dove, but as big as a cock. It flew over me and said in my ear, Tomorrow the dead hunter Gracchus is coming. Receive him in the name of the city. The hunter nodded and licked his lips with the tip of his tongue. Yes, the doves flew here before me. But do you believe, Burgomaster, that I shall remain in Riva? I cannot say that yet, replied the Burgomaster. Are you dead? Yes, said the hunter. As you see, many years ago. Yes, it must be a great many years ago. I fell from a precipice in the Black Forest, that is in Germany, when I was hunting a uh, chamois, uh, you know, a cham chamois, ch uh, C H A M O I S. Since then, I have been dead. 
But you are alive, too, said the Burgomaster. In a certain sense, said the hunter. In a certain sense, I am alive, too. My death ship lost its way. A wrong turn of the wheel. A moment's absence of mind on the pilot's part. A longing to turn aside towards my lovely native country. I cannot tell what it was. I only knew, know this, that I remained on earth, and that ever since my ship has sailed earthly waters. So I, who asked for nothing better than to live among my mountains, travel after my death through all the lands of the earth. And you have no part in the other world? asked the Burgomaster, knitting his brow. I am forever, replied the hunter, on the great stair that leads up to it. On that infinitely wide and spacious stair, I clamber about, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes on the right, sometimes on the left, always in motion. The hunter has been turned into a butterfly. Do not laugh. I am not laughing, said the Burgomaster, in self-defense. That is very good of you, said the hunter. I am always in motion. But when I make a supreme flight and see the gate actually shining before me, I awaken presently on my old ship, still stranded forlornly in some earthly sea or other. The fundamental error of my one-time death grins at me as I lie in my cabin. Julia, the wife of the pilot, knocks at the door and brings me my beer, uh, the morning drink of the land whose coasts we chance to be passing. Oh, brings me on my beer, the morning drink of the land whose coasts we chance to be passing. I lie on a wooden pallet. I wear, it cannot be a pleasure to look at me, a filthy winding, winding sheet. My hair and beard, black tinged with gray, have grown together inextricably, inextricably. My limbs are covered with a great flower-patterned woman's shawl with long fringes. A sacramental candle stands at my head and lights me. On the wall opposite me is a little picture, evidently of a bushman who is aiming his spear at me and taking cover as best he can behind a beautifully painted shield. On shipboard, one is often a prey to stupid imaginations, but that is the stupidest of them all. Otherwise, my wooden case is quite empty. Through a hole in the side wall come in the warm airs of the southern night, and I hear the water slapping against the old boat. I have lain here ever since the time when, as the hunter Gracchus, living in the Black Forest, I followed Chemoy, uh, Chemoyus, Ch Chemoas, and fell from a precipice. Everything happened in good order. I pursued, I fell, bled to death in a ravine, died, and this ship should have conveyed me to the next world. I can still remember how gladly I stretched myself out on this pallet for the first time. Never did the mountains listen to such songs from me as these shadowy walls did then. I had been glad to live, and I was glad to die. Before I stepped aboard, I joyfully flung away my wretched load of ammunition, my knapsack, my hunting rifle that I had always been proud to carry, and I slipped into my winding sheet like a girl into her marriage dress. I lay and waited. Then came the mishap. A terrible fate, said the Burgomaster raising his hand defensively. And you bear no blame for it? None, said the hunter. I was a hunter. Was there any sin in that? I followed my calling as a hunter in the Black Forest, where there were still wolves in those days. I lay in ambush, shot, hit my mark, flayed the skins from my victims. Was there any sin in that? My labors were blessed. The great hunter of the Black Forest was the name I was given. Were there any sin in that? I am not called upon to decide that, said the Burgomaster, but to me also there seems to be no sin in such things, but then who is the guilt? But but then whose is the guilt? The boatman's, said the hunter. Nobody will read what I say here. No one will come to help me. Even if all the people were commanded to help me, every door and window would remain shut. Everybody would take to bed and draw the bedclothes over his head. The whole earth would become an inn for the night, and there is no sense in that, for nobody knows of me. And if anyone knew, he would not know where I could be found, and if he knew where I could be found, he would not know how to deal with me. He would not know how to help me. The thought of helping me is an illness that has, has to be cured by taking to one's bed. I know that. And so I, I do not shout to summon help. 
even though at moments when I lose control over myself, as I have done just now, for instance, I think seriously of it. But to drive out such thoughts, I need only look around me and verify where I am. And I can safely assert, have been for hundreds of years. Extraordinary, said the Burgomaster. Extraordinary. And now, do you think of staying here in Riva with us? I think not, said the hunter with a smile. And, to excuse himself, he laid his hand on the Burgomaster's knee. I am here more than that I do not know. Further than that, I cannot go. My ship has no rudder, and it is driven by the wind that blows in the undermost regions of death. Again, what a tome of nonsense. What a glorious journey it's been so far. How are we feeling? Good? I'm going to continue. A Hunger Artist. These are the short stories of Franz Kafka, uh, read without previous reading. A Hunger Artist. Some of us are, are playing that out day to day. I feel malnourished if I haven't had fast food in three days, uh, and that's the truth of it. And I consider like a big deli sandwich with a lot of cheese on it fast food, you know, when you when you spend nine dollars at a deli for a hero of Philly cheesesteak or something. That's what I'd really like right now, but I'm not gonna go do that. A hunger artist. During these last decades, the interest in professional fasting has markedly diminished. It used to pay very well to stage great performances under one's own management, but today that is quite impossible. We live in a different world now. At one time, the whole town took a lively interest in the hunger artist. From day to day of his fast, the excitement mounted. Everybody wanted to see him at least once a day. There were people who bought season tickets for the last few days and sat from morning till night in front of his small barred cage. Even in the nighttime, there were visiting hours when the whole effect was heightened by torch flares. On fine days, the cage was set out in the open air and then it was the children's special treat to see the hunger artist. For their elders, he was often just a joke that happened to be in fashion. But the children stood open-mouthed, holding each other's hands for greater security, marveling at him as he sat there pallid in black tights with his ribs sticking out so prominently, not even on a seat, but down among straw on the ground, sometimes giving a courteous nod, answering questions with a constrained smile or perhaps stretching an arm through the bars so that one might feel how thin it was, and then again withdrawing deep into himself, paying no attention to anyone or anything, not even to the all-important striking of the clock that was the only piece of furniture in his cage, but merely staring into vacancy with half-shut eyes, now and then taking a sip from a tiny glass of water to moisten his lips. Besides casual onlookers, there were also relays of permanent watchers selected by the public, usually butchers. Strangely enough, and it was their task to watch the hunger artist day and night, three of them at a time, in case he should have some secret recourse to nourishment. This was nothing but a formality, instituted to reassure the masses, for the initiates knew well enough that during this fast, the artist would never, in any circumstances, not even under forcible compulsion, swallow the smallest morsel of food. The honor of his profession forbade it. Not every watcher, of course, was capable of understanding this. There were often groups of night watchers who were very lax in carrying out their duties and deliberately huddled together in a retired corner to play cards with great absorption, obviously intending to give the hunger artist the chance of a little refreshment, which they supposed he could draw from some private hoard. Nothing annoyed the artist more than such watchers. They made him miserable. They made his fast seem unendurable. Sometimes he mastered his feebleness sufficiently to sing during their watch, for as long as he could keep going, to show them how unjust their suspicions were. But that was of little use. They only wondered at his cleverness in being able to fill his mouth even while singing. Much more to his taste were the watchers who sat close up to the bars, who were not content with the dim night lighting of the, the hall, but focused him in the full glare of the electric pocket torch given them by the impresario. The harsh light did not trouble him at all. In any case, he could never sleep properly, and he could always drowse a little. Whatever the light, at any hour, even when the hall was thronged with noisy onlookers, 
He was quite happy at the prospect of spending a sleepless night with such watchers. He was ready to exchange jokes with them, to tell them stories out of his nomadic life, anything at all to keep them awake and demonstrate to them again that he had no eatables in his cage and that he was fasting not as fasting as not one of them could fast. But his happiest moment was when the morning came and an enormous breakfast was brought them at his expense on which they flung themselves with the keen appetite of healthy men after a weary night of wakefulness. Of course, there were people who argued that this breakfast was an unfair attempt to bribe the watchers, but that was going rather too far. And when they were invited to take on the, a night's vigil without a breakfast, merely for the sake of the cause, they made themselves scarce, although they stuck stubbornly to their suspicions. Such suspicions, anyhow, were a necessary accompaniment to the profession of fasting. No one could possibly watch the hunger artist continuously, day and night, and so no one could produce first-hand evidence that the fast had really been rigorous and continuous. Only the artist himself could know that. He was therefore bound to be the sole completely satisfied spectator of his own fast. Yet, for other reasons, he was never satisfied. It was not perhaps mere fasting that had brought him to such skeleton thinness that many people had regretfully to keep away from his exhibitions because the sight of him was too much for them. Perhaps it was perhaps it was his dissatisfaction with himself that had worn him down. For he alone knew what no other initiate knew, how easy it was to fast. It was the easiest thing in the world. He made no secret of this, yet people did not believe him. At best at the best they set him down as modest. Most of them, however, thought he was out for publicity, or else was some kind of cheat who found it easy to fast because he had discovered a way of making it easy, and then had the impudence to admit the fact, more or less. He had to put up with all of that, and in the course of time had got used to it. But his inner dissatisfaction always rankled, and never yet, after any term of fasting, this must be granted to his credit, had he left the cage of his own free will. The longest period of fasting was fixed by his impresario at 40 days. Beyond that term, he was not allowed to go, not even in great cities. And there was good reason for it, too. Experience had proved that for about 40 days, the interest of the public could be stimulated by a steadily increasing pressure of advertisement. But after that, the town began to lose interest. Sympathetic support began notably to fall off. There were, of course, local variations as between one town and another, or one country and another, but as a general rule, 40 days marked the limit. The limit. So on the 40th day, the flower-bedecked cage was opened enthusiastically. Spectators filled the hall, a military band played, two doctors entered the cage to measure the results of the fast, which were announced through a megaphone, and finally two young ladies appeared, blissful at having been selected for the honor, to help uh, the hunger artist down the few steps leading to a small table on which was spread a carefully chosen invalid repast. And at this very moment, the artist always turned stubborn. True, he would entrust his bony arms to the outstretched helping hands of the ladies bending over him, but stand up he would not. Why stop fasting at this particular moment, after forty days of it? He had held out for a long time. An illimitably long time. Why stop now, when he was in his best fasting form, or rather, not quite in his best fasting form? Why should he be cheated of the fame he would get for fasting longer, for being not only the record hunger artist of all time, which presumably he was already, but for beating his own record by a performance beyond human imagination, since he felt that there was no limits to his capacity for fasting? His public pretended to admire him so much, why should it have so little patience with him? If he could endure fasting longer, why shouldn't the public endure it? Besides, he was tired. He was comfortable sitting in the straw, and now he was supposed to lift himself to his full height and go down to a meal, the very thought of which gave him nausea, that only the presence of the ladies kept him from betraying, and even that with an effort. And he looked up into the eyes of the ladies who were apparently so friendly, in reality so cruel, and shook his head, which felt too heavy on its strengthless neck. But then there happened yet again what always happened. The impresario came forward without a word, for the band made speech impossible, lifted his arms in the air above the artist, as if inviting heaven to look down upon its creature here in the straw, this suffering martyr, which indeed he was, although in quite another sense, grasped 
him round the emaciated waist with exaggerated caution, so that the frail condition he was in might be appreciated, and committed him to the care of the blenching ladies, not without secretly giving him a shaking, so that his legs and body tottered and swayed. The artist now submitted completely, his head lolled on his breast, as if it had landed there by chance. His body was hollowed out, his legs in a spasm of self-preservation clung close to each other at the knees, yet scraped on the ground as if they were not as if it were not really solid ground, as if they were only trying to find solid ground. And the whole weight of his body, a featherweight after all, relapsed in onto one of the ladies, who, looking round for help and panting a little, this post of honor was not at all what she had expected it to be, first stretched her neck as far as she could to keep her face at least free from contact with the artist, then finding this impossible, and her more fortunate companion not coming to her aid, but merely holding extended on her own trembling hand the little bunch of knuckle bones that was the artist's, to the great delight of the spectators, burst into tears and had to be replaced by an attendant who had long been stationed in readiness. Then came the food, a little of which the impresario managed to get between the artist's lips while he sat in a kind of half-fainting trance to the accompaniment of cheerful patter designed to distract the public's attention from the artist's condition. After that, a toast was drunk to the public, supposedly prompted by a whisper from the artist in the impresario's ear. The band confirmed it with a mighty flourish. The spectators melted away, and no one had any cause to be dissatisfied with the proceedings. No one except the hunger artist himself. He only, as always. So he lived in, so he lived for many years, with small regular intervals of recuperation. Invisible glory, honored by the world, yet in spite of that troubled in spirit, and all the more troubled because no one would take his trouble seriously. What comfort could he possibly need? What more could he possibly wish for? And if some good-natured person feeling sorry for him tried to console him by pointing out that his melancholy was probably caused by fasting, it could happen, especially when he had been fasting for some time, that he reacted with an outburst of fury, and to the general alarm, began to shake the bars of his cage like a wild animal. Yet the impresario had a way of punishing these outbreaks, which he rather enjoyed putting into operation. He would apologize publicly for the artist's behavior, which was only to be excused, he admitted, because of the irritability caused by fasting, a condition hardly to be understood by well-fed people. Then, by natural transition, he went on to mention the artist's equally incomprehensible incom boast that he could fast for much longer than he was doing. He praised the high ambition, the goodwill, the great self-denial, undoubtedly implicit in such a statement, and then quietly, and then quite simply countered it by bringing out photographs, which were also on sale to the public, showing the artist on the fortieth day of a fast lying in bed almost dead from exhaustion. This perversion of the truth, familiar to the artist though it was, always unnerved him afresh, and proved too much for him. What was a consequence of the premature ending of his fast was here presented as the cause of it. To fight against this lack of understanding, against a whole world of non-understanding, was impossible. Time and time again, in good faith, he stood by the bars listening to the impresario. But as soon as the photographs appeared, he always let go and sank with a groan back to his straw. And the reassured public could once more come close and gaze at him. A few years later, when the witnesses of such scenes called them to mind, they often failed to understand themselves at all. For meanwhile, the aforementioned change in public interest had set in. It seemed to happen almost overnight. There may have been profound causes for it, but who was going to bother about that? At any rate, the pampered hunger artist suddenly found himself deserted one fine day by the amusement seekers who went streaming past him to other more favored attractions. For the last time, the impresario hurried him over half, hurried him over half Europe to discover whether the old interest might still survive here and there, all in vain, everywhere, as if by secret agreement. A positive revulsion came from professional fasting was in evidence. Uh, a positive revulsion from professional fasting was in evidence. Of course, it could not really have sprung up so suddenly as all that, and many promontory 
promontory symptoms which had not been sufficiently remarked or suppressed during the rush and glitter of success now came retrospectively to mind, but it was now too late to take any countermeasures. Fasting would surely come into fashion again at some future date, yet that was no comfort for those living in the present. What, then, was the hunger artist to do? He had been applauded by thousands in his time, and could be applauded by thousands, and could hardly come down to showing himself in a street booth at village fairs. And as for adopting another profession, he was not only too old for that, but too fanatically devoted to fasting. So he took leave of the impresario, his partner, in an unparalleled career, and hired himself to a large circus. In order to spare his own feelings, he avoided reading the conditions of his contract. Bad choice. You always got to read the contract. If you're going to agree to a job, like me, I almost agreed to do juggling this summer. They weren't going to provide housing. Okay. Never stop fasting. Thank you, K4. <laughs> okay. A large circus with its enormous traffic in replacing and recruiting men, animals, and apparatus can always find a use for people at any time, even for a hunger artist, provided, of course, that he does not ask too much. And in this particular case, anyhow, anyhow it was not only the artist who was taken on, but his famous and long-known name as well. Indeed, considering the peculiar nature of his performance, which was not impaired by advancing age, it could not be objected that here was an artist past his prime, no longer at the height of his professional skill, seeking a refuge in some quiet corner of a circus. On the contrary, the hunger artist averred that he could fast as well as ever, which was entirely credible. He even alleged that if he were allowed to fast as he liked, and this was at once promised him, Without more ado, he could astound the world by establishing a record never yet achieved, a statement which certainly provoked a smile among the other professionals, since it left out of account the change in public opinion, which the hunger artist in his zeal conveniently forgot. He had not, however, actually lost his sense of the real situation, and took it as a matter of course that he and his cage should be stationed, not in the middle of the ring as a main attraction, but outside, near the animal cages, on a site that was, after all, easily accessible. Large and gaily painted placards made a frame for the cage and announced what was to be seen inside it. When the public came thronging out in intervals to see the animals, they could hardly avoid passing the hunger artist's cage and stopping there for a moment. Perhaps they might even have stayed longer had not those pressing behind them in the narrow gangway, who did not understand why they should be held up on their way towards the excitements of the menagerie, made it impossible for anyone to stand gazing quietly for any length of time. And that was the reason why the hunger artist, who had, of course, been looking forward to these visiting hours as the main achievement of his life, began instead to shrink from them. At first, he could hardly wait for the intervals. It was exhilarating to watch the crowds come streaming his way, only to see too soon, not even the most obstinate self-deception clung to almost consciously could hold out against the fact, the conviction was borne in upon him that these people, most of them, to judge from their actions, again and again, without exception, were all on their way to the menagerie. And the first sight of them from the distance remained the best. For when they reached his cage, he was at once def deafened by the storm of shouting and abuse that arose from the two contending factions which renewed themselves continuously of those who wanted to stop and stare at him he soon began to dislike them more than the others not out of real interest but only out of obstinate self-assertiveness and those who wanted to go straight on to the animals when the first great rush was passed the stragglers came along and these whom nothing could have prevented from stopping to look at him as long as they had breath raced past with long strides, hardly even glancing at him, in their haste to get to the menagerie in time, and all too rarely did it happen that he had a stroke of luck when some father of a family fetched up before him with his children, pointed a finger at the hunger artist, and explained at length what the phenomenon meant, telling stories of earlier years, when he himself had watched similar but much more thrilling performances, and the children still rather uncomprehending, since neither inside nor outside school had they been sufficiently prepared for this lesson, what did they care about fasting? Yet showed by the brightness of their intent eyes that new and better times might be coming. Perhaps, said the hunger artist to himself many a time, things would be a little better if his cage were set not quite so near the menagerie. That made it too easy for people to make their choice, to say nothing of what he suffered from the stench of the menagerie, the animal's restlessness by night, 
the carrying past of raw lumps of flesh for the beasts of prey, the roaring at feeding times, which depressed him continually. But he did not care to lodge a complaint with the management. After all, he had the animals to thank for the troops of people who passed his cage, among whom there might always be one here and there to take an interest in him, and who could tell where they might seclude him if he called attention to his existence and thereby to the fact that, strictly speaking, he was only an impediment on the way to the menagerie. A small impediment, to be sure, one that grew steadily less. People grew familiar with the strange idea that they could be expected in times like these to take an interest in a hunger artist. And with this familiarity, the verdict went out against him. He might fast as much as he could, and he did so, but nothing could save him now. People passed him by. Just try to explain to anyone the art of fasting. Anyone who has no feeling for it cannot be made to understand it. The fine placards grew dirty and illegible. They were torn down. The little notice board telling the number of fast days achieved, which at first was changed carefully every day, had long stayed at the same figure. For after the first few weeks, even this small task seemed pointless to the staff. And so the artist simply fasted on and on, as he had once dreamed of doing, and it was no trouble to him just to see it always foretold, but no one counted the days. No one, not even the artist himself, knew what records he was already breaking, and his heart grew heavy. And when once in a time some leisurely passerby stopped, made merry over the old figure on the board, and spoke of swindling, that was, in its way, the stupidest lie ever invented by indifference and inborn malice. Since it was not the hunger artist who was cheating, he was working honestly, but the world was cheating him of his reward. Many more days went by, however, and that too came to an end. An overseer's eye fell on the cage one day, and he asked the attendants why this perfectly good stage should be left standing there unused with dirty straw inside it. Nobody knew until one man, helped out by the notice board, remembered about the hunger artist. They poked into the straw with sticks and found him in it. Are you still fasting? asked the overseer. When on earth do you mean to stop? Forgive me, everybody, whispered the hunger artist. Only the overseer, who had his ear to the bars, understood him. Of, of course, said the overseer, and tapped his forehead with a finger to let the attendants know that the what state the man was in. We forgive you. I always wanted you to admire my fasting, said the hunger artist. We do admire it, said the overseer, affably. But you shouldn't admire it, said the hunger artist. Well, then we don't admire it said the overseer. But why shouldn't we admire it? Because I have to fast. I can't help it, said the hunger artist. What a fellow you are, said the overseer. And why can't you help it? Because, said the hunger artist, lifting his head a little and speaking, with his lips pursed as if for a kiss, right into the overseer's ear, so that no syllable might be lost. Because I couldn't find the food I liked. If I had found it, believe me, I should have made no fuss and stuffed myself like you or anyone else. These were his last words, but in his dimming eyes remained the firm, though no longer proud, persuasion that he was still continuing to fast. Well, clear this out now said the overseer, and they buried the hunger artist, straw and all. Into the cage they put a young panther. Even the most insensitive felt it refreshing to see this wild creature leaping around the cage that had so long been dreary. The panther was all right. The food he liked was brought to him without hesitation by the attendants. He seemed not even to miss his freedom. His noble body, furnished almost to the bursting point with all that it needed, seemed to carry freedom around with it too. Somewhere in his jaws it seemed to lurk, and the joy of life streamed with such ardent passion from his throat that for the onlookers it was not easy to stand the shock of it. But they braced themselves, crowded round the cage, and did not want ever to move away. Interesting. I think I like that one quite a lot. Hey, Ethan. 
All right. Investigations of a Dog. Another selected short story of Mr. Kafka. Investigations of a Dog. A Double Dog. How much my life has changed, and yet how unchanged it has remained at bottom. When I think back and recall the time when I was still a member of the canine community, sharing in all its preoccupations, a dog among dogs, I found on closer examination that from the very beginning I sensed some discrepancy, some little maladjustment, causing a slight feeling of discomfort, which not even the most decorous public functions could eliminate. More that sometimes, no, not sometimes, but very often, the mere look of some fellow dog of my own circle that I was fond of, the mere look of him, as if I had just caught it for the first time, would fill me with helpless embarrassment and fear, even with despair. I tried to quiet my apprehensions as best I could. Friends, to whom I divulged them, helped me. More peaceful times came. Times, it is true, in which these sudden surprises were not lacking, but in which they were accepted with more philosophy fitted into my life with more philosophy, uh, with more philosophy, inducing a certain melancholy and lethargy, it may be, but nevertheless allowing me to carry on as a somewhat cold, reserved, shy, and calculating, but all things considered normal enough, dog. Normal enough. How, indeed, without these intervals of convalescence, could I have reached the age that I enjoy at present? How could I have fought my way through the serenity with which I contemplate the terrors of youth and endure the terrors of age? How could I have come to the point where I am able to draw the consequences of my admittedly unhappy, or to put it more moderately, not very happy position, and live almost entirely in accordance with them? Solitary and withdrawn, with nothing to occupy me, save the, my hopeless, but, as far as I am concerned, indispensable little investigations, that is how I live, yet, in my distant isolations, Isolation, I have not lost sight of my people. News often penetrates to me, and now and then I even let news of myself reach them. The others treat me with respect, but do not understand my way of life. Yet they bear me no grudge, and even young dogs, whom I sometimes see passing in the distance, a new generation of whose childhood I have only a vague memory, do not deny me a reverential greeting. Well, that's nice. For it must not be assumed that, for all my peculiarities which lie open to the day, I am in the least exempt from the laws of my species. Indeed, when I reflect upon it, and I have time and disposition and capacity enough for that, I see that dogdom is in every way a marvelous institution. Apart from us dogs, there are all sorts of creatures in the world, wretched, limited, dumb creatures who have no language but mechanical cries. Many of us dogs study them, have given them names, try to help them, educate them, uplift them, and so on. For my part, I am quite indifferent to them, except when they try to disturb me. I confuse them with one another. I ignore them. But one thing is too obvious to have escaped me, namely how little inclined they are, compared with us dogs, to stick together, how silently and unfamiliarly, and with what a curious hostility, they pass each other by. How mean are the interests that suffice to bind them together for a little in ostensible union, and how often these very interests give rise to hatred and conflict. Consider us dogs, on the other hand. One can safely say that we all live together in a literal heap, all of us different as we are from one another on account of, uh, of numberless and profound mod modifications which have arisen in the course of time, all in one heap. We are all drawn to each other, and nothing can prevent us from satisfying that communal impulse. All our laws and institutions, the few that I still know and the many that I have forgotten, go back to this lounging, go, <laughs> go back to this longing for the greatest bliss we are capable of, the warm comfort of being together. But now consider the other side of the picture. No creatures, to my knowledge, live in such wide dispersion as we dogs. None have so many distinctions of class, of kind, of occupation, distinction too numerous to review at a glance. We, whose one desire is to stick together, and again and again we succeed at transcendent moments in spite of everything. We, above all others, are compelled to live separated from one another by strange vocations that are often incomprehensible even to our canine neighbors, holding firmly to laws that are not those of the dog world, but are actually directed against it. How baffling these questions are, questions on which one would prefer not to touch 
I understand that standpoint too. I understand that standpoint too, even better than my own, and yet questions to which I have completely capitulated. Why do I not do as the others? Live in harmony with my people and accept in silence whatever disturbs the harmony, ignoring it as a small error in the great account. Always keeping in mind the things that bind us happily together, not those that drive us again and again, as though by sheer force, out of our social circle. I can recall an incident in my youth. I was at the time in one of those inexplicable, blissful states of exaltation, and which everyone must have experienced as a child. I was still quite a puppy. Everything pleased me. Everything was my concern. I believed that great things were going on around me, of which I was the leader, and to which I must lend my voice, things which must be wretchedly thrown aside if I did not run for them and wag my tail for them. Childish fantasies had fled with riper years, but at the time their power was very great. I was completely under their spell, and presently something actually did happen, something so extraordinary that it seemed to justify my wild expectations. In itself, it was nothing very extraordinary, for I have seen many such things, and more remarkable things too, often enough, uh, often enough since. But at the time, it struck me with all the force of a first impression, one of those impressions which can never be erased and influence much of one's later conduct. I encountered, in short, a little company of dogs, or rather, I did not encounter them. They appeared before me. Before that, I had been running along in darkness for some time, filled with a premonition of great things, a premonition that may well have been delusive, for I always had it. <laughs> I had run in darkness for a long time, up and down, blind and deaf to everything, led on by nothing but a vague desire, and now, suddenly, I came to a stop with the feeling that I was in the right place, and looking up, saw that it was bright day, only a little hazy and everywhere a blending and confusion of the most intoxicating smells. I greeted the morning with an uncertain barking, when, as if I had conjured them up, out of some place of darkness, to the accompaniment of terrible sounds such as I had never heard before, seven dogs stepped into the light. Had I not distinctly seen that they were dogs, and that they themselves brought the sound of them, though I could not recognize how they produced it, I would have run away at once. But as it was, I stayed. At that time, I still knew hardly anything of the creative gift for music that which the canine race alone is endowed. God, what? Uh, it had naturally enough escaped my... It had naturally enough escaped my but slowly developing powers of observation. For though music had surrounded me as a perfect natural and indispensable element of existence ever since I was a suckling, an element which nothing impelled me to distinguish from the rest of existence, my elders had drawn my attention to it only by such hints as were suitable for a childish understanding. All the more astonishing then, indeed devastating, were these seven great musical artists to me. They did not speak, they did not sing, they remained, all of them, silent, almost determinedly silent. But from the empty air they conjured music. Everything was music. The lifting and setting down of their feet, certain turns of the head, their running and their standing still, the positions they took up in relation to one another, the symmetrical patterns which they produced by one dog setting his front paws on the back of another and the rest following suit until the first bore the weight of the other six, or by all lying flat on the ground and going through complicated concerted evolutions and None made a false move. Not even the last dog, though he was a little unsure, did not always establish contact at once with the others, sometimes hesitated, as it were, on the stroke of the beat, but yet was unsure only by comparison with the superb sureness of the others. The superb sureness of the others. And even if he had been much more unsure, indeed quite unsure, would not have been able to do any harm. The others, great masters of all of them, keeping the rhythm so unshakably. But it is too much to say that I even saw them, that I actually even saw them. They appeared from somewhere. I inwardly greeted them as dogs, and although I was profoundly confused by the sounds that accompanied them, yet they were dogs nevertheless, dogs like you and me. I regarded them by force of habit simply as dogs that I'd happened to meet on my road, and felt a wish to approach them and exchange greetings. They were quite near, too. Dogs much older than I, certainly, and not of my woolly, long-haired kind, but 
yet not so very alien in size and shape, indeed quite familiar to me, for I had already seen many such or similar dogs. But while I was still involved in these reflections, the music gradually got the upper hand, literally knocked the breath out of me and swept me far away from those actual little dogs, and quite against my will, where I howled, while I howled, as if some pain were being inflicted upon me, my mind could attend to nothing but this blast of music which seemed to come from all sides, from the heights, from the deeps, from everywhere, seizing the listener by the middle, overwhelming him, crushing him, and over his swooning body, still blowing fanfares so near that they seemed far away and almost inaudible. And then a respite came, for one was already too exhausted, too annulled, too feeble to listen any longer. A respite came, and I beheld again the seven little dogs carrying out their evolutions, making their leaps. I longed to shout to them in spite of their aloofness, to beg them to enlighten me, to ask them what they were doing. I was a child and believed I could ask anybody about anything, but hardly had I begun, hardly did I feel on good and familiar doggish terms with the seven, when the music started again, robbed me of my wits, whirled me around in its circles as if I myself were one of the musicians, instead of being only their victim, cast me hither and thither, no matter how much I begged for mercy, and rescued me finally from its own violence by driving me into a labyrinth of wooden bars which rose round that place, though I had not noticed it before, but which now firmly caught me kept my head pressed to the ground, and though the music still resounded in the open space behind me, gave me a little time to get my breath back. I must admit that I was less surprised by the artistry of the seven dogs, it was incomprehensible to me, and also quite definitely beyond my capacities, than by their courage in facing so openly the music of their own making, and their power to endure it calmly without collapsing. But now, from my hiding hole, I saw on looking more closely, that it was not so much coolness as the most extreme tension that characterized their performance. These limbs, apparently so sure, and their movements quivered at every step with a perpetual apprehensive twitching. As if rigid with despair, the dogs kept their eyes fixed on one another, and their tongues, whenever the tension weakened for a moment, hung wearily from their jowls. It could not be fear of failure that agitated them so deeply. Dogs that could dare and achieve such things had no need to fear that. Then why were they afraid? Who then forced them to do what they were doing? And I could no longer restrain myself, particularly as they now seemed in some incomprehensible way in need of help. And so, through all the din of the music, I shouted out my questions loudly and challengingly. But they, incredible, incredible, they never replied behaved as if I were not there. Dogs who make no reply to the greeting of other dogs are guilty of an offense against good manners, which the humblest dog would never pardon any more than the greatest. Perhaps they were not dogs at all, but how should they not be dogs? Could I not actually hear on listening more closely the subdued cries with which they encouraged each other, drew each other's attention to difficulties, warned each other against errors, could I not see the last and youngest dog to whom most of the cries were addressed, often stealing a glance at me as if he would have dearly wished to reply but refrained because it was not allowed? But why should it not be allowed? Why should the very thing which our laws unconditionally command not be allowed in this one case? I became, I became indignant at the thought and almost forgot the music. Those dogs were violating the law. Great magicians they might be, but the law was valid for them too. I knew that quite well, though I was a child, and having recognized that I now noticed something else. They had good grounds for remaining silent. That is, assuming that they remained silent from a sense of shame. For how they were for how were they conducting themselves? Because of all the music I had not noticed it before, but they had flung away all shame. The wretched creatures were doing the very thing, which is both most ridiculous and indecent in our eyes. They were walking on their hind legs. Fie on them. They were uncovering their nakedness, blatantly making a show of their nakedness. They were doing that 
as though it were a meritorious act, and when, obeying their better instincts for a moment, they happened to let their front paws fall, they were literally appalled, as if at an error, as if nature were an error, hastily raised their legs again, and their eyes seemed to be begging for forgiveness, for having been forced to cease momentarily from their abomination. Was the world standing on its head? Where could I be? What could have happened? If only for my own sake, I dared not hesitate any longer now. I dislodged myself from the tangle of bars, took one leap into the open, and made towards the dogs. I, the younger scholar, must be the teacher now, must make them understand what they were doing, must keep them from committing further sin. And old dogs too, and old dogs too, I kept on saying to myself. But scarcely was I free, and only a leap or two away from the dogs, when the music again had me in its power. Perhaps in my ardor I might even have managed to withstand it, for I knew it better now. If in the midst of all its majestic amplitude, which was terrifying, but still not inconquerable, a clear, piercing, continuous note, which came without variation, literally from the remotest distance, perhaps the real melody in the midst of the music, had not now rung out, forcing me to my knees. Oh, the music these dogs made almost drove me out of my senses. I could not move a step farther. I no longer wanted to instruct them. They could go on raising their front legs, committing sin and seducing others to the sin of silently regarding them. I was such a young dog. Who could demand such a difficult task from me? I made myself still more insignificant than I was. I whimpered. And if the dogs had asked me now what I thought of their performance, probably I would have, I would have had not a word to say against it. Besides, it was not long before the dogs vanished with all their music and their radiance into the darkness from which they had emerged. As I have already said, this whole episode contains nothing of much note. In the course of a long life, one encounters all sorts of things, which, taken from their context and seen through the eyes of a child, might well seem far more astonishing. Besides, one may, of course, in the pungent popular phrase, have got it all wrong, as well as everything connected with it. Then it could be demonstrated that this was simply a case where seven musicians had assembled to practice their art in the morning stillness that a very young dog had strayed to the place a burdensome intruder whom they had tried to drive away by particularly terrifying or lofty music unfortunately with success he pestered them with his questions were they already disturbed enough by the mere presence of the stranger to be expected to attend to his distracting interruptions as well and make them worse by responding to them, even if the law commands us to reply to everybody, was such a tiny stray dog, in truth, a somebody worthy of the name. And perhaps they did not even understand him, for he likely enough barked his questions very indistinctly, or perhaps they did not understand him, and with great self-control answered his questions, but he, a mere puppy unaccustomed to music, could not distinguish the answer from the music. And as for the walking on their hind legs, perhaps, unlike other dogs, they actually used only these for walking. If it was a sin, well, it was a sin, but they were alone, seven friends together, an intimate gathering within their own four walls, so to speak, quite private, so to speak. For one's friends, after all, are not the public, and where the public is not present, an inquisitive little street dog is certainly not capable of constituting it, but granting this, is it not as if nothing at all had happened? It's not quite so, but very nearly so, and parents should not let their children run about so freely, and had much better teach them to hold their tongues and respect the aged. But if all this is admitted, then it disposes of the whole case. But many things are disposed of in the minds of grown-ups, but many things that are disposed of in the minds of grown-ups are not yet settled in the minds of the young. I rushed about, told my story, asked questions, made accusations and investigations, tried to drag others to the place where all this had happened, and burned to show everybody where I had stood, where the seven had stood, and where and how they had danced and made their music, and if anyone had come with me, instead of shaking me off and laughing at me. I would probably have sacrificed my innocence and tried myself to stand on my hind legs so as to reconstruct the scene clearly. Now children are blamed for all they do, but also in the last resort forgiven for all they do. 
and I have preserved my childish qualities, and in spite of that, have grown to be an old dog. Well, just as at that time, I kept on unceasingly discussing the foregoing incident, which today I must confess I lay far less importance upon, analyzing it into its constituent parts, arguing it with my listeners without regard to the company I found myself in, devoting my whole time to the problem, which I found as wearisome as everybody else, but which, that was the difference, for that very reason I was resolved to pursue indefatigably until I solved it, so that I might be left free again to regard the ordinary calm happy life of every day. Just so have I, though with less childish means, yet the difference is not so very great, labored in the years since, and gone on laboring today. But it began with that concert. I do not blame the concert. It is my innate disposition that has driven me on, and it would certainly have found me some other opportunity, and it would certainly have found some other opportunity of coming into action had the concert never taken place. Yet the fact that it happened so soon used to make me feel sorry for myself. It robbed me of a great part of my childhood, the blissful life of that young dog, which many can spin out for years, in my case lasted for only a few short months. So be it. There are more important things than childhood, and perhaps I had the prospect of far more childish happiness earned by a life of hard work in my old age than an actual child would have the strength to bear, but which I, which then I should, I'm going to read that again. And perhaps I have the prospect of far more childish happiness earned by a life of hard work in my old age than any actual child would have the strength to bear, but which then I shall possess. I began my inquiries with the simplest things. There was no lack of material. It is the actual super abundance, unfortunately, that casts me into despair in my darker hours. I began to inquire into the question, what the canine race nourished itself upon. Now that is, if you like, by no means a simple question. Of course, it has occupied us since the dawn of time. It is the chief object of all our medication. Countless observations and essays and views on the subject have been published. It has grown into a province of knowledge, which in its prodigious, prodigious compass is not only beyond the comprehension of any single scholar, but of all our scholars collectively, a burden which cannot be borne except by the whole of the dog community, and even then with difficulty, and not quite in its totality, for it ever and again crumbles away like a neglected ancestral inheritance, and must laboriously be rehabilitated anew, not to speak at all of the difficulties and almost unfulfillable conditions of my investigation. No one need point all this out to me. I know it all as well as any average sensual dog can do. I have no ambition to meddle with real scientific matters. I have all the respect for knowledge that it deserves, but to increase knowledge I lack the equipment, the diligence, the leisure, and not least, and particularly during the past few years, the desire as well. I swallow down my food, but the slightest preliminary methodi uh, methodical politico-economical observation of it does not seem to me worthwhile. In this connection, the essence of all knowledge is enough for me. The simple rule with which the mother weans her young, her young ones from her teats and sends them out into the world, water the ground as much as you can. And in this sentence is not almost everything contained. <laughs> what has scientific inquiry, ever since our first fathers inaugurated it, of decisive importance to add to this more details, mere details, and how uncertain they are, but this rule will remain as long as we are dogs. It concerns our main staple of food. True, we have also other resources, but only at a pinch. And if the year is not too bad, we could live on this main staple of our food, this food we find on the earth, but the earth needs our water to nourish it, and only at that price provides us with our food, the emergence of which, however, and this should not be forgotten, can also be hastened by certain spells, songs, and ritual movements. But in my opinion, that is all. There is nothing else that is fundamental to be said on the question. In this opinion, moreover, I am at one with the vast majority of the dog community, and must firmly disassociate myself I'm sorry, dissociate myself from all heretical views on this point. Quite honestly, I have no ambition to be peculiar or to pose as being in the right against the majority. I am only too happy when I can agree with my comrades as I do in this case. My own inquiries, however, are in another direction. 
My personal observation tells me that the earth, when it is watered and scratched according to the rules of science, extrudes nourishment. And moreover, in such quality, in such abundance, in such ways, in such places, at such hours, as the laws partially or completely established by science demand. I accept all this. My question, however, is the following. Whence does the earth produce, procure, <laughs> whence does the earth procure this food? A question which people in general pretend not to understand, and to which the best answer they can give is, if you haven't enough to eat, we'll give you some of ours. Now consider this answer. I know that it is not one of the virtues of dogdom to share with others food that has once gained, uh, to share with others food that one has once gained possession of. Life is hard, the earth stubborn, science rich in knowledge, but poor in practical results. Anyone who has food keeps it to himself. That is not selfishness, but the opposite. Dog law, the unanimous decision of the people, the outcome of their victory over egoism, for the possessors are always in a minority. And for that reason, this answer, if you haven't enough to eat, we'll give you some of ours, is merely a way of speaking, a jest, a form of raillery. I have not forgotten that. But all the more significant did it seem to me when I was rushing about everywhere with my questions during those days that they put the jest aside as far as I was concerned. True, they did not actually give me anything to eat. Where could they have found it at a moment's notice? And even if anyone chanced to have some food, naturally he forgot everything else in the fury of his hunger. Yet they all seriously meant what they said when they made the offer. And here and there, right enough, I was presently allowed some slight trifle if I was only smart enough to snatch it quickly. <laughs> How it came that people treated me so strangely, pampered me, favored me, because I was a lean dog, badly fed and neglectful of my needs. But there were countless badly fed dogs running about, and the others snatched even the wretchedest scrap from under their noses whenever they could, and not often from greed, but generally on principle. No, they treated me with special favor. I cannot give much detailed proof of this, but I have a firm conviction that it was so. Was it my questions, then, that pleased them? And that they regarded as so clever? No, my questions did not please them and were generally looked on as stupid. And yet it could not have been my questions that won me their attention. It was as if they would rather do the impossible that is stop my mouth with food. They did not do it, but they would have liked to do it than endure my questions. But in that case, they would have done better to drive me away and refuse to listen to my questions. No, they did not want to do that. They wanted... They did not want, indeed, to listen to my questions, but it was because I asked questions that they did not want to drive me away. That was the time. Much as I was ridiculed and treated as a silly puppy and pushed here and pushed there, the time when I actually enjoyed most public esteem, never again was I to enjoy anything like it. I had free entry ev everywhere. No obstacle was put in my way. I was actually flattered, though the flattery was disguised as rudeness, and all really because of my questions my impatience, my thirst for knowledge. Did they want to lull me to sleep, to divert me, without violence, almost lovingly from a false path? Yet a path whose falseness was not so completely beyond all doubt that violence was permissible. Also, a certain respect and fear kept them from employing violence. I divined, even in those days, something of this. Today I know it quite well, far better than those who actually practiced it at the time. What they wanted to do was really to divert me from my path. They did not succeed. They achieved the opposite. My vigilance was sharpened. More, it became clear to me that it was I who was trying to seduce the others, and that I was actually successful up to a certain point. Only with the assistance of the whole dog world could I begin to understand my own questions. For instance, when I asked... Whence does the earth procure this food? Was I troubled, as uh, appearances might quite well indicate, about the earth? Was I troubled about the labors of the earth? Not in the least. That, as I very soon recognized, was far from my mind. All that I cared for was the race of dogs. That and nothing else. For what is there actually except our own species? To whom but it? Can one appeal in the wide and empty world? All knowledge in the totality of all questions and all answers is contained in the dog. If one could but realize this knowledge, if one could but bring it into the light of day, if we dogs would but own that we know infinitely more than we admit to ourselves. Even the most loquacious dog is more secretive of his knowledge than the places where good food can be found. Trembling with desire, 
whipping yourself with your own tail. You steal cautiously upon your fellow dog. You ask, you beg, you howl, you bite, and achieve, and achieve what you could have achieved just as well without any effort. Amiable attention, friendly con contiguity, contiguity, honest acceptance, ardent embraces, barks that mingle as one. Everything is directed towards achieving an ecstasy, a forgetting and finding again. But the one thing that you long to win above all, the admission of knowledge, remains denied to you. To such prayers, whether silent or loud, the only answer you get, even after you have employed your powers of seduction to the uttermost, sorry, utmost, are Vacant stares, averted glances, troubled and veiled eyes. It is much the same as it was when a mere puppy, I shouted to the dog musicians, and they remained silent. Now, one might say you torment yourself because of your fellow dogs, because of their silence on crucial questions. You assert that they know more than they admit, more than they will allow to be valid, and that this silence, the mysterious reason for which is also, of course, tacitly concealed, poisons existence and makes it unendurable for you so that you must enter so that you must either alter it or have done with it that may be but you are yourself a dog you have also the dog knowledge well bring it out not merely in the form of a question but as an answer if you utter it who will think of opposing you the great choir of dogdom will join in as if it had been waiting for you then you will have clarity, truth, a vowel, as much of them as you desire. The roof of this wretched life, of which you say so many hard things, will burst open, and all of us, shoulder to shoulder, will ascend into the lofty realm of freedom. And if we should not achieve that final consummation, if things should become worse than before, if the whole truth should be more insupportable than the half, it should be proved that the silent are in the right, as the guardians of existence, if the faint hope that we still possess should give way to complete hopelessness, the attempt is still worth the trial, since you do not desire to live as you are compelled to live. Well, then, why do you make it a reproach against the others, that they are silent and remain silent yourself? That's what you may say. That, that's what you may say. Easy to answer, because I am a dog. In essentials, just as locked in silence as the others, stubbornly resisting my own questions, dour out of fear. To be precise, it is in the hope that they might answer me that I have questioned my fellow dogs, at least since my adult years. Have I any such foolish hope? Can I contemplate the foundations of our existence, divine, divine their profundity, watch the labor of their construction, that dark labor, and expect all this to be forsaken, neglected, undone, simply because I ask a question? No, that I truly expect no longer. I understand my fellow dogs, and flesh of their flesh, of their miserable, ever-renewed, ever-desirous flesh. But it is not merely flesh and blood that we have in common, but knowledge also, and not only knowledge, but the key to it as well. I do not possess that knowledge, but uh, the key. Mm, I do not possess that key except in common with all the others. I cannot grasp it without their help. The hardest bones containing the richest marrow can be conquered only by a united crunching of all the teeth of all dogs. That, of course, is only a figure of speech and exaggerated. But if all teeth were but ready, they would not need even to bite. The bones would crack themselves, and the marrow would be freely accessible to the feeblest of dogs. If I remain faithful to this metaphor, then the goal of my aims, my questions, my inquiries, appears monstrous. It is true, for I want to compel all dogs thus to assemble together. I want the bones to crack open under the pressure of their collective preparedness, and then I want to dismiss them to the ordinary life that they love, while all by myself, almost as if I wanted to feed the marrow, not merely of a bone, Oh, as if I wanted to feed on the marrow, not merely of a bone, but of the whole canine race itself. But it is only a metaphor. The marrow that I am discussing here is no food. On the contrary, it is a poison. My questions only serve as a goad to myself. I only want to be stimulated by the silence which rises up around me as the ultimate answer. How long will you be able to endure the fact that the world of dogs, as your researchers make more and more evident, is pledged to silence and always will be. How long will you be able to endure it? That is the real great question of my life, before which all smaller ones sink into insignificance. It is 
put to myself alone, and concerns no one else. Unfortunately, I can answer it more easily than the smaller specific questions. I shall probably hold on, hold out, till my natural end. The calm of old age will put up a greater and greater resistance to all disturbing questions. I shall very likely die in silence, and surrounded by silence, indeed, almost peacefully. And I look forward to that with composure. An admirably strong heart, lungs that it is impossible to use up before their time have been given to us dogs as if in malice. We survive all questions, even our own bulwarks of silence that we are. Recently, I have taken more and more to casting up my life, looking for the decisive, the fundamental error that I must surely have made, and I cannot find it. And yet, I must have made it. For if I had not made it, and yet were unable by the diligent labor of a long life to achieve my desire, that would prove that my desire is impossible, and complete hopelessness must follow. Behold, then, the work of a lifetime. First of all, my inquiries into the question, whence does the earth procure the food it gives us? A young dog, at bottom naturally greedy for life, I renounced all enjoyments, apprehensively avoided all pleasures, buried my head between my front paws when I was confronted by temptation, and addressed myself to my task. I was no scholar, neither in the information I acquired, nor in method, nor in intention that was probably a defect but it could not have been a decisive one i had had little schooling for i had left my mother's care at an early age soon got used to independence led a free life and premature independence is inimical to systematic learning but i have seen much listened too much spoken with dogs of all sorts and conditions understood everything i believe fairly intelligently and correlated my particular observations fairly intelligently that has compensated somewhat for my lack of scholarship, not to mention that independence, if it is a disadvantage in learning things, is an actual advantage when one is making one's own inquiries. In my case, it was all the more necessary, as I was not able to employ the real method of science to avail myself, that is, of the labors of my predecessors and establish contact with contemporary investigators. I was entirely cast on my own resources, began at the very beginning, and with the consciousness in by inspiriting to youth, but utterly crushing to age, that the fortuitous, fortuitous <laughs> I was entirely cast on my own resources, began at the very beginning, and with the consciousness inspiriting to youth, but utterly crushing to age, that the fortuitous point to which I carried my labors must also be the final one. Was I really so alone in my inquiries at the beginning and up to now? Yes and no. It is inconceivable that there must not always have been and that there are not today individual dogs in the same case as myself. I cannot be so accursed as that. I do not deviate from the dog nature by a hair breadth. Every dog has like me in the impulse has like me the impulse to question, and I have like every dog the impulse not to answer. Everyone has the impulse to question. How otherwise could my questions have affected my hearers in the slightest? And they were often affected to my ecstatic delight, an exaggerated delight, I must confess, and how otherwise could I have been prevented from achieving much more than I have done, and that I have the compulsion to remain silent needs, unfortunately, no particular proof. I am, at bottom, then, no different from any other dog. Everybody, no matter how he may differ in opinion from me and reject my views, will gladly admit that I, and I in turn will admit as much of any other dog. Gladly admit that, and I in turn will admit as much of any other dog. Only the mixture of the elements is different. A difference very important for the individual, insignificant for the race. And now can one credit that the composition of these available elements has never chanced through all the past and present to result in a mixture similar to mine. One, moreover, if mine be regarded as unfortunate, more unfortunate still? To think so would be Contrary to all experience, we dogs are all engaged in the strangest occupations, occupations in which one would refuse to believe if one had not the most reliable information concerning them. The best example that I can quote is that of the soaring dog. The first time I heard of one, I laughed and simply refused to believe it. What? One was asked to believe that there was a very tiny species of dog, not much bigger than my head, even when it was fully grown, and this dog, who must of course be a feeble creature, an artificial, weedy, brushed, and curled fop by all accounts, incapable of making an honest jump. This dog was supposed, according to the people's stories, to remain for the most part high up in the air, apparently doing nothing at all but simply resting there. No, 
To try to make me swallow such things was exploiting the simplicity of a young dog too outrageously, I told myself, but shortly afterwards I heard from another source an account of another soaring dog. Could there be a conspiracy to fool me? But after that, I saw, I saw the dog musicians with my own eyes, and from that day I considered everything possible. No prejudices fettered my powers of apprehension. I investigated the most senseless rumors, following them as far as they could take me, and the most senseless seemed to me in this senseless world more probable than the sensible, and moreover particularly fertile for investigation. So it was, too, with the soaring dogs. I discovered a great many things about them. True, I have succeeded to this day in seeing none of them. But of their existence I have been firmly convinced for a long time, and they occupy a more important, an, an important place in my picture of the world. As usual, it is not, of course, their technique that chiefly gives me to think. It is wonderful. Who can gainsay it that these dogs should be able to float in the air? In my amazed admiration for that, I am at one with my fellow dogs. But far more strange to my mind is the senselessness, the dumb senselessness of these existences. They have no relation whatsoever to the general life of the community. They hover in the air, and that is all. And life goes on its usual way. Someone now and then refers to art and artists, but there it ends. But why, my good dogs, why on earth do these dogs float in the air? What sense is there in their occupation? Why can no one get why can one get no word of explanation regarding them? Why do they hover up there, letting their legs the pride of dogs, fall into desuetude, desuetude, d-e-s-u-e-t-u-d-e, -E -E. desuetude, preserving a detachment from the nourishing earth, reaping without, heavier, uh, reaping without having sowed, being particularly well provided for, as I hear, and at the cost of the dog community, too. I can flatter myself that my inquiries into these matters made some stir. People began to investigate after a fashion, to collect data. They made a beginning, at least, although they are never likely to go farther. But after all, that is something. And though the truth will not be discovered by such means, Never can that stage be reached. Yet they throw light on some of the profounder ramifications of falsehood. For all the senseless phenomena of our existence, and the most senseless by far of all, are susceptible of investigation. Not completely, of course, that is the diabolical jest, but sufficiently to spare one painful questions. Take the soaring dogs once more as an example. They are not haughty, as one might imagine at first, but rather particularly dependent upon their fellow dog. If one tries to put oneself in their place, one will see that. For they must do what they can to obtain pardon, and not openly. That would be a violation of the obligation to keep silence. They must do what they can to obtain pardon for their way of life, or else divert attention from it so that, they, so that it may be forgotten. And they do this, I have been told, by means of an almost unendurable volubility. They are perpetually talking, partly of their philosophical reflections, with which, seeing that they have completely renounced bodily exertion, they can continuously occupy themselves, partly of the observations which they have made from their exalted stations, and although, as is very understandable considering their lazy existence, they are not much distinguished for intellectual power, and their philosophy is as worthless as their observations, and science can make hardly any use of their utterances, and besides, it is not reduced to draw assistance from such wretched sources. Nevertheless, if one asks what the soaring dogs are really doing, one will invariably receive the reply that they are, con they are that they contribute a great deal to knowledge. That is true, remarks someone, but their contributions are worthless and wearisome. The reply to that is a shrug, or a change of the subject, or annoyance, or laughter, and in a little while, when you ask again, you learn once more that they contribute to knowledge, and finally, when you are asked the question, you yourself will reply, if you are not careful, to the same effect. And perhaps, indeed, it is well not to be obstinate, but to yield to public sentiment, to accept the extent soaring dogs, and without recognizing their right to existence, which cannot be done, yet to tolerate them. But more than this must not be required. That would be going too far. And yet, the demand is made. We are perpetually being asked to put up with new soaring dogs who are always appearing. One does not even know where they come from. Do these dogs multiply by propagation? Have they actually the strength for that? 
for they are nothing much more than a beautiful coat of hair, and what is there in that to propagate? But even if that improbable contingency were possible, when could it take place? For they, in, uh, they are invariably seen alone, self-complacently floating high up in the air, and if for once in a while they descend to take a run, it lasts only for a minute or two. A few menacing, mincing struts, and once more they are back in strict solitude, absorbed in what is supposed to be profound thought, from which, even when they exert themselves to the uttermost, they cannot tear themselves free, or at least so they say. But if they do not propagate their kind, is it credible that there can be no dogs who voluntarily give up life on the solid ground, voluntarily become soaring dogs, and merely for the sake of the comfort and a certain technical accomplishment choose that empty life on cushions up there? It is unthinkable. Neither propagation nor voluntary transition is thinkable. The, the facts, however, show that there are always new soaring dogs in evidence from which one must conclude that in spite of obstacles which appear insurmountable to our understanding, no dog species, however curious, ever dies out once it exists, or at least not without a tough struggle, not without being capable of putting up a successful defense for a long time. What are we talking about here? But if that is valid for such an out-of-the-way, externally odd, inefficient species as the soaring dog, must I not also accept it as valid for mine? Besides, am I not in the least queer outwardly? An ordinary, an ordinary middle-class dog, such as is very prevalent in this neighborhood, at least, I am neither particularly exceptional in any way, nor particularly repellent in any way, and in my youth and to some extent also in my maturity. So long as I attended to my appearance and had lots of exercise, I was actually considered a very handsome dog. My front view was particularly admired, my slim legs, the fine set of my head, but my silvery white and yellow coat, which curled only half, uh, which curled only at the hair tips, was very pleasing too. In all that, there was nothing strange. The only strange thing about me is my nature. Yet even that, as I am always careful to remember, has its foundation in universal dog nature. Now, if not even the soaring dogs live in isolation, but invariably manage to encounter their fellows somewhere or other in the great dog world, and even to conjure new generations of themselves out of nothingness, then I too can live in the confidence that I am not quite forlorn. Certainly, the fate of types like mine must be a strange one, and the existence of my colleagues can never be a visible help to me, if for no other reason than that I should scarcely ever be able to recognize them. We are the dogs who are crushed by the silence, who long to break through it, literally to get a breath of fresh air. The others seem to thrive on silence. True, that is only so in appearance, as in the case of the musical dogs, who ostensibly were quite calm when they played, but in reality were in a state of intense excitement. Nevertheless, the illusion is very strong. One tries to make a breath in it, but it mocks every attempt. What help, then, do my colleagues find? What kind of attempts do they make to manage to go on living in spite of everything? These attempts may be of various kinds. My own bout of questioning while I was young was one, so I thought uh, that perhaps if I associated with those who asked many questions, I might find my real comrades. Well, I did for some time, with great self-control, a self-control made necessary by the annoyance I felt when I was interrupted by perpetual questions that I mostly could not answer myself, for the only thing that concerns me is to obtain answers. Moreover, who but is eager to ask questions when he is young? And how, when so many questions are going about, are you to pick out the right questions? One question sounds like another. It is the intention that counts, but that is often hidden even from the questioner. And besides, it is a peculiarity of dogs to be always asking questions. They ask them confusedly altogether. It is as if in doing that, they were trying to obliterate even every trace of the genuine questions. No, my real colleagues are not to be found among the youthful questioners and just as little among the old and silent to whom I now belong. But what good are all these questions, for they have failed me completely. Apparently my colleagues are cleverer dogs than I, and have recourse to other excellent methods that enable them to bear this life, methods which, nevertheless, as I can tell from my own experience, though they may perhaps help at a pinch, though they may calm, lull to rest, distract, are yet on the whole as important, as, <laughs> as impotent as my own. For no matter where I look, I can see no sign of their success. I'm afraid that the last thing by which I can hope to recognize my real colleagues is their success. 
But where then are my real colleagues? Yes, that is the burden of my complaint. That is the kernel of it. Where are they? Everywhere and nowhere. Perhaps my next door neighbor, only three jumps away, is one of them. We often bark across to each other. He calls on me sometimes too, though I do not call on him. Is he my real colleague? I do not know. I certainly see no sign of it in him, but it is possible. It is possible, but all the same, nothing is more improbable. When he is away, I can amuse myself, drawing on my fancy by discovering in him many things that have a suspicious resemblance to myself. But once he stands before me, all my fancies become ridiculous. As an old dog, a little smaller even than myself, and I am hardly medium size, brown, short-haired, with a tired hang of the head and a shuffling gait. On top of all this, he trails his left hind leg behind him a little because of some disease. For a long time now, I have been more intimate with him than with anybody else. I am glad to say that I can still get on tolerably well with him, and when he goes away, I shout the most friendly greetings after him, though not out of affection, but in anger at myself. For if I follow him, I find him just as disgusting again, slinking along there with his trailing leg and his much too low hind quarters. Sometimes it seems to me as if I were trying to humiliate myself by privately calling him my colleague. Nor in my talks does he betray any trace of similarity of thoughts. True, he is clever and cultured enough as these things go here, and I could learn much from him. But is it for cleverness and culture that I am looking? We converse usually about local questions, and I am astonished. My isolation has made me more clear-sighted in such matters. How much intelligence is needed even by an ordinary dog, even in average and not unfavorable circumstances, if he is to live out his life and defend himself against the greater of life's customary dangers? True, knowledge provides the rules one must follow, but even to grasp them imperfectly and in rough outline, outline is by no means easy. And when one has actually grasped them, the real difficulty still remains, namely to apply them to local conditions. Here almost nobody can help. Almost every hour brings new tasks, and every new patch of earth is specific problems. No one can maintain that he has settled everything for good, and that henceforth his life will go on, so to speak, of itself. Not even I myself, though my needs shrink literally from day to day. And all this ceaseless labor, to what end? Merely to entomb oneself deeper and deeper in silence? It seems so deep that one can never be dragged out of it again by anybody. People often cry up the universal progress made by the dog community throughout the ages, and probably mean by that more particularly the progress in knowledge. Certainly knowledge is progressing, its advance is irresistible, but actual, actually progresses at an accelerating speed, always faster. But what is there to praise in that? It is as if one were to praise someone because with the years he grows older, and in consequence comes nearer and nearer to death with increasing speed. That is a natural and moreover an ugly process in which I find nothing to praise. I can only see decline everywhere. In saying which, however, I do not mean that earlier generations were essentially better than ours, but only younger. That was their great advantage. Their memory was not so overburdened as ours today. It was easier to get them to speak out, and even if nobody actually succeeded in doing that, the possibility of it was greater, and it is indeed this greater sense of possibility that moves us so deeply when we listen to those old and strangely simple stories. Here and there we catch a curiously significant phrase, and we would almost like to leap to our feet if we did not feel the weight of centuries upon us. Now, whatever objection I may have to my age, my former generations were not better. Indeed, in a sense, they were far worse, far weaker. Even in those days, wonders did not openly walk the streets for anyone to seize, but all the same dogs, I cannot put it any other way, had not yet become so doggish as today. The evidence of dogdom was still loosely put together. The true word could still have intervened, planning or replanning the structure, changing it at will, transforming it into its opposite, and the word was there, was very near at least, on the tip of every, everybody's tongue. Anyone might have hit upon it. And what has become of it today? Today one may pluck out one's very heart and not find it. Our generation is lost, it may be, but it is more blameless than those earlier ones. I can understand the hesitation of my generation. Indeed, it is no longer mere hesitation. 
It is the thousands. It is the thousand, thousands, thousandth forgetting of a dream dreamt a thousand times and a forgotten and <laughs> and forgotten a thousand times. And who can damn us merely for forgetting for the thousandth time? But I fancy I understand the hesitation of our forefathers, too. We would probably have acted just as they did. Indeed, I could almost say, well, for us, that it was not we who had to take the guilt upon us, that instead we can hasten in almost guiltless silence toward death in a world darkened by others. When our first fathers strayed, they had doubtless scarcely any notion that their aberration was to be an endless one. They could still literally see the crossroads, it seemed, as an easy matter to turn back whenever they pleased. And if they hesitated to turn back, it was merely because they wanted to enjoy a dog's life for a little while longer. It was not yet a genuine dog's life. And already it seemed intoxicatingly beautiful to them. So what must it become in a little while, a very little while? And so they strayed farther. They did not know what we can now guess at, contemplating the course of history, that change begins in the soul before it appears in ordinary existence, and that when they began to enjoy a dog's life, they must already have possessed real old dog souls, and were by no means so near their starting point as they thought, or as their eyes feasting on all doggish joys tried to persuade them. But who can speak of youth at this time of day? These were the really young dogs. But their sole ambition, unfortunately, was to become old dogs, truly a thing which they could not fail to achieve, as all succeeding generations show, and ours, the last, most clearly of all. Naturally, I do not talk to my neighbor of these things, but often I cannot but think of them when I am sitting opposite him, that typical old dog, or bury my nose in his coat, which already has a whiff of the smell of, of cast-off hides, to talk to him, or even to any of the others about such things, would be pointless. I know what course the conversation would take. He would urge a slight objection now and then, but finally he would agree. Agreement is the best weapon of defense, and the matter would be buried. Why indeed trouble to exhume it at all? And in spite of this, there is a profounder understanding between my neighbor and me, going deeper than mere words. I shall never cease to maintain that, though I have no proof of it, and perhaps am merely suffering from an ordinary delusion caused by the fact that for a time... This dog has been the only one with whom I have held any communication, and so I am bound to cling to him. Are you, after all, my colleague in your own fashion, and ashamed because of everything, uh, because everything has miscarried with you? Look, the same fate has been mine. When I am alone, I weep over it. Come, it is sweeter to weep in company. I often has, have such thoughts as these, and then I give him a prolonged look. He does not lower his glance, but neither can one read anything from it. He gazes at me dully, wondering why I am silent and why I have broken off the conversation. But perhaps that very glance is his way of questioning me, and I disappoint him just as he disappoints me. In my youth, if other problems had not been more important to me then, and I had not been perfectly satisfied with my own company, I would probably have asked him straight out and received an answer flatly agreeing with me. And that would have been worse even than today's silence. But is not everybody silent exactly in the same way? What is there to prevent me from believing that everyone is my colleague instead of thinking that I have only one or two fellow inquirers lost and forgotten along with their petty achievements so that I can never reach them by any road through the darkness of ages or the confused throng of the present? Why not believe that all dogs from the beginning of time have been my colleagues, all diligent in their own way, all unsuccessful in their own way, all silent or falsely garrulous in their own way, as hopeless research is apt to make one? But in that case I need not have severed myself from my fellows at all. I could have remained quietly among the others. I had no need to fight my way out like a stubborn child through the closed ranks of the grown-ups who indeed wanted as much as I to find a way out and who seemed incomprehensible to me simply because of their knowledge which told them that nobody could ever escape and that it was stupid to use force. Such ideas however are definitely due to the influence of my neighbor. He confuses me, he fills me with dejection, and yet in himself he is happy enough, at least when he is 
in his own quarters, I often hear him shouting and singing. It is really unbearable. It would be a good thing to renounce this last tie, also to cease giving way to the vague dreams which all contact with dogs unavoidably provokes. Unavoidably provokes. No matter how hardened one may consider oneself, and to employ the short time that still remains for me exclusively in pers prosecuting my researches. The next time he comes, I shall slip away, or pretend I am asleep and keep up the pretense until he stops visiting me. Also, my researches have fallen into desuetude. I relax, I grow weary, I trot mechanically where I once raced enthusiastically. I think of the time when I began to inquire into the question, whence does the earth procure this food? Then indeed, I really lived among the people. I pushed my way where the crowd was thickest, wanted everybody to know my work and be my audience, and my audience was even more essential to me than my work. I still expected to produce some effect or other, and that naturally gave me a great impetus, which now that I am solitary is gone. But in those days I was so full of strength that I achieved something unprecedented, something at a variance with all our principles, and that every contemporary eyewitness assuredly recalls now as an uncanny feat. Our scientific knowledge, which generally makes for an extreme specialization, is remarkably simple in one province. I mean, where it teaches that the earth engenders our food, and then, after having laid down this hypothesis, gives the methods by which the different foods may be achieved in their best kinds and greatest abundance. Now, it is of course true that the earth brings forth all food. Of that there can be no doubt, but as simple as people generally imagine it to be, the matter is not, and their belief that it is simple prevents further inquiry. Take an ordinary occurrence that happens every day. If we were to be quite inactive, as I am almost completely now, and after a perfunctory scratching and watering of the soil, lie down and wait for what has what was to come, then we should find the food on the ground, assuming that it is, that is, that a result of some kind is inevitable. Nevertheless, that is not what usually happens. Those who have preserved even a little freedom of judgment on scientific matters, and their numbers are truly small, for science draws a wider and wider circle round itself, will easily see without having to make any specific experiment that the main part of the food that is discovered on the ground in such cases comes from above. Indeed, customarily, we snap up most of our food according to our dexterity and greed before it has reached the ground at all. In saying that, however, I am saying nothing against science. The earth, of course, brings forth this kind of food, too. Whether the earth draws one kind of food out of itself and calls another down, calls down another kind from the skies, perhaps makes no essential difference, and science, which has established that in both cases it is necessary to prepare the ground, need not perhaps concern itself with such distinctions, for it does not say... If you have food in your jaws, you have solved all questions for the time being. But it seems to me that science nevertheless takes a veiled interest, at least to some extent, in these matters, insomuch as it recognizes two chief methods of procuring food, namely the actual preparation of the ground, and secondly, the auxiliary perfecting processes of incantation, dance, and song. I find here a distinction in accordance with the one I have myself made. Not a definitive distinction, perhaps, but yet clear enough. The scratching and watering of the ground, in my opinion, opinion serves to produce both kinds of food and remains indispensable. Incantation, dance, and song, however, are concerned less with the ground food in the narrower sense and serve principally to attract the food from above. Tradition fortifies me in this interpretation. The ordinary dogs themselves set science right here without knowing it and without science being able to venture a word in reply if as science claims these ceremonies minister only to the soil giving it the potency let us say to attract food from the air then logically they should be directed exclusively to the soil it is the soil that the incantations must be whispered to the soil that must be danced to and to the best of my knowledge science ordains nothing else than this but now comes the remarkable thing the people in all their ceremonies gaze upwards. This is no insult to science, and science does not forbid it, but leaves the husbandman complete freedom in his respect. In its teaching, it takes only the soil into account, and if the husbandman carries out its instructions concerning the preparation of the ground, it is content. Yet, in my opinion, it should really demand more than this if it is logical. And though I have never been deeply initiated into science, I simply cannot conceive how the learned can bear to let our people, unruly and passionate as they are, chant their incantations with their faces turned upward, upwards, 
wail our ancient folk songs into the air, and spring high in their dances as though, forgetting the ground, they wished to take flight from it forever. I took this contradiction as my starting point, and whenever, according to the teachings of science, the harvest time was approaching, I restricted my attention to the ground, and it was the ground that I scratched in the dance. And I almost gave myself a crick in the neck, keeping my head as close to the ground as I could. Later, I dug a hole for my nose and sang and declaimed into it so that only the ground might hear and nobody else beside or above me. The results of my experiment were meager. Sometimes the food did not appear, and I was already preparing to rejoice at this proof, but then the food would appear. It was exactly as if my strange performance had caused some confusion at first, but had shown itself later to possess advantages, so that in my case the usual barking and leaping could be dispensed with. Often, indeed, the food appeared in greater abundance than formerly, but then again it would stay away altogether. With a diligence hitherto unknown in a young dog, I drew up exact reports of all my experiments, fancied that here and there I was on a scent that might lead me further, but then it lost itself again in obscurity. My inadequate grounding in science also undoubtedly held me up here. Grounding, uh, what guarantee had I, for instance, that the absence of food was not caused by unscientific preparation of the ground rather than my experiments? And if that should be so, then all my conclusions were invalid. In certain circumstances, I might have been able to achieve an almost scrupulously exact experiment. Namely, if I had succeeded only once in bringing down the food by an upward incantation without preparing the ground at all, then, and then had failed to extract the food by an incantation directed exclusively to the ground, I attempted indeed something of this kind, but without any real belief in it, and without the conditions being quite perfect. For it is my fixed opinion that a certain amount of ground preparation is always necessary, and even if the heretics who deny this are right, their theory can never be proved in any case, seeing that the watering of the ground is done under a kind of compulsion, and within certain limits, simply cannot be avoided. Another and somewhat tangential experiment succeeded better and aroused some public attention, arguing from the customary method of snatching food while still in the air, I decided to allow the food to fall to the ground, but to make no effort to snatch it. Accordingly, I always made a small jump in the air when the food appeared, but timed it so that it might always fail of its object. In the majority of instances, the food fell dully and indifferently to the ground in spite of this, and I flung myself furiously upon it with the fury both of hunger and of disappointment. But in isolated cases, something else happened, something really strange. The food did not fall, but followed me through the air. The food pursued the hungry. That never went on for long, always for only a short stretch, then the food fell after all, or vanished completely, or, the most common case, my greed put a premature end to the experiment, and I swallowed down the tempting food. All the same, I was happy at that time. A stir of curiosity ran through my neighborhood. I attracted uneasy attention. I found my acquaintances more accessible to my questions. I could see in their eyes a gleam that seemed like an appeal for help, and even if it was only the reflection of my own glance, I asked for nothing more. I was satisfied, and to the last I discovered, and the others discovered it simultaneously, that this experiment of mine was a commonplace of science, had already succeeded with others far more brilliantly than me, with me, than with me, and though it had not been attempted for a long time on account of the extreme self-control it required, had also no need to be repeated, for scientifically it had no value at all. It only proved what was already known, that the ground not only attracts food vertically from above, also at a slant, indeed sometimes in spirals. So there I was, left with my experiment, but was not discouraged. I was too young for that. On the contrary, this disappointment braced me to attempt perhaps the greatest achievement of my life. I did not believe the scientist's depreciations of my experiment, yet belief was of no avail here, but only proof, and I resolved to set about establishing that that and thus raised my experiment from its original irre irrelevance and set it in the very center of the field of research. I wished to prove that when I retreated before the food, it was not the ground that attracted it at a slant, but I who drew it after me. This first experiment, it is true, I could not carry any further. To see the food before one and experiment in a scientific experiment, spirit at the same time, one cannot keep that up indefinitely. But I decided to do something else. I resolved to fast completely as long as I could stand it, and at the same time avoid all sight of food, all temptation. If I were to withdraw myself in this manner, remain lying day and night with closed eyes, trouble myself neither to snatch food from the air nor to lift it from the ground, and if, as I dared, not expect 
yet faintly hoped, without taking any of the customary measures, and merely in response to the unavoidable irrational watering of the ground and the quiet resuscitation, recitation of the incantations and songs, the dance I wished to admit, so as not weaken my powers. The food were to come of itself from above, and without going near the ground, were to knock at my teeth for admittance. If that were to happen, then, even if science was not confuted, for it has enough elasticity to admit exceptions and isolated cases, I asked myself what would the other dogs say, who fortunately do not possess such extreme elasticity, for this would be no exceptional case like those handed down by history, such as the incident, let us say, of the dog who refuses because of body, bodily illness or trouble of mind to prepare the ground, to track down and seize his food, upon which the whole dog community recite magical formulae, and by this means succeed in making the food deviate from its customary route into the jaws of the invalid. I, on the contrary, was perfectly sound, and at the height of my powers, my appetite so splendid that it prevented me all day from thinking of anything but itself. I submitted, moreover, whether it be credited or not, voluntarily to my period of fasting, was myself quite able to conjure so, and so I asked no assistance from the dog community, and indeed rejected it in the most determined manner. I sought a suitable place for myself in an outlying clump of bushes, where I would have to listen to no talk of food, no sound of munching jaws and bones being gnawed. I ate my fill for the last time and laid me down. As far as possible, I wanted to pass my whole time with closed eyes, until the food came, it would be perpetual night for me, even though my vigil might last for days or weeks. During that time, however, I dared not sleep much, better indeed if I did not sleep at all, and that made everything much harder, for I must not only conjure food, conjure the food down from the air, but I must also be on my guard lest I should be asleep when it arrived. Yet on the other hand, sleep would be very welcome to me, for I would manage to fast much longer asleep than awake. For those reasons, I decided to arrange my time prudently and to sleep a great deal, but always in short snatches. I achieved this by always resting my head while I slept on some frail twig, which soon snapped and so awoke me. So there I lay, sleeping or keeping watch, dreaming or singing, or <laughs> singing quietly to myself. My first vigils passed uneventfully. Perhaps in the place whence the food came, no one had yet noticed that I was lying there in resistance to the normal course of things, and so there was no sign. I was a little disturbed in my concentration by the fear that the other dogs might miss me, presently find me, and attempt something or other against me. A second fear was that at the mere wetting of the ground, though it was unfruitful ground, according to the findings of science, some chance nourishment might appear and seduce me by its smell. But for a time nothing of that kind happened and I could go on fasting. Apart from such fears, I was more calm during this first stage than I could remember ever, ever having been before. Although in reality I was laboring to annul the findings of science, I felt within me a deep reassurance, indeed, almost the proverbial serenity of the scientific worker. In my thoughts, I begged forgiveness of science. There must be room in it for my researches too. Consolingly, in my ears rang the assurance that no matter how great the effect of my inquiries might be, and indeed, the greater the better. I would not be lost to ordinary dog life. Science regarded my attempts with benevolence. Itself, it itself would undertake the interpretation of my discoveries, and that promise already meant fulfillment. While until now I had felt outlawed in my innermost heart and had run my head against the traditional walls of my species like a savage, <laughs> I would now be accepted with great honor. The long yearned for warmth of assembled canine bodies would lap me around. I would ride uplifted high on the shoulders of my fellows. Remarkable effects of my first hunger. My achievement seemed so great to me that I began to weep with emotion and self-pity there among the quiet bushes, which it must be confessed was not very understandable. For when I was looking forward to my well-earned reward, why should I weep? Probably out of pure happiness. It is always when I am happy, and that is seldom enough, that I weep. After that, however, these feelings soon passed. My beautiful fancies led, fled one by one before the increasing urgency of my hunger. A little longer, and I was, after an abrupt farewell to all my imaginations and sublime feelings, totally alone with the hunger burning in my entrails. That is my hunger, I told myself countless times during this stage, 
as if I wanted to convince myself that my hunger and I were still two things, and I could shake it off like a burdensome lover. But in reality, we were very painfully one. And when I explained to myself, that is my hunger, it was really my hunger that was speaking and having its joke at my expense. A bad, bad time. I still shuddered to think of it. And not merely, please note this, on account of the suffering I had endured then, but because I know I was insufficiently equipped then, and consequently shall have to live through that suffering once more if I am ever to achieve anything. For today I still hold fasting to be the final and most potent weapon of research. The way goes through fasting. The highest, if it is attainable, is attainable only by the highest effort, and the highest effort among us is voluntary fasting. So when I think of those times and I would gladly pass my life in brooding over them, I cannot help thinking also of the time that still threatens me. It seems to me that it takes almost a lifetime to recuperate from such an attempt. My whole life as an adult lies between me and that fast, and I have not recovered yet. When I begin upon my next fast, I shall perhaps have more resolution than the first time because of my greater experience and the deeper insight into the need for that attempt. But my powers are still enfeebled by that first essay, and so I shall probably begin to fail at the mere approach of these familiar horrors. My weaker appetite will not help me. It will reduce the value of the attempt only by a little, uh, very little, and will indeed probably force me to fast longer than was necessary the first time. I think I am clear on these and many other matters. The long interval has not been wanting in trial attempts. Often enough, I have literally got my teeth into hunger but I was not still strong enough for the ultimate effort. And now the unspoiled ardor of youth is of course gone forever. It vanished in the great privations of that first fast. All sorts of thoughts tormented me. Our forefathers appeared threateningly before me. True, I held them responsible for everything, even if I dared not say so openly. It was they who involved our dog life in guilt, and so I could easily have responded to their menaces with counter menaces. <laughs> with counter menaces, 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 with counter menaces, but I bow before their knowledge. It came from sources of which we know no longer, and for that reason, much as I may feel compelled to oppose them, I shall never actually overstep their laws, but content myself with wriggling out through the gaps for which I have particularly, I have a particularly good nose. On the question of fasting, I appealed to the well-known dialogue in the course of which. One of our sages once expressed the intention of forbidding fasting, but was dissuaded by a second with the words, But who would ever think of fasting? Whereupon the first sage allowed himself to be persuaded and withdrew the prohibition. But now arises the question, is not fasting really forbidden after all? The great majority of commentators deny this and regard fasting as freely permitted, and holding as they think with the second sage, do not worry in the least about the evil consequences that may result from erroneous interpretations. I had naturally assured myself on this point before I began my fast, but now that I was twisted with the pangs of hunger, and in my distress of mind sought relief in my own hind legs, despairingly licking and gnawing at them up to the very buttocks, the universal interpretation of this dialogue seemed to me entirely and completely false. I cursed the commentator's science. I cursed myself for having been led astray by it. For the dialogue contained, as any child could see, more than merely one prohibition of fasting. The first sage wished to forbid fasting. What a sage wishes is already done. So fasting was forbidden. As for the second sage, he not only agreed with the first, but actually considered fasting impossible, piled, therefore, on the first prohibition a second, that of dog nature itself. The first sage saw this and thereupon withdrew the explicit prohibition, that was to say he imposed upon all dogs the matter now being, being now settled, the obligation to know themselves and to make their own prohibitions regarding fasting. So here was a threefold prohibition instead of merely one, and I had violated it. Now I could at least have obeyed at this point, though tardily, but in the midst of my pain I felt a longing to go on fasting, and I followed it as greedily as if I were a strange dog, as if it were a strange dog. I could not stop. Perhaps, too, I was already too weak to get up and seek safety for myself in familiar scenes. I tossed about on the fallen forest leaves. I could no longer sleep. I heard noises on every side. 
The world, which had been asleep during my life hitherto, seemed to have been awakened by my fasting. I was tortured by the fancy that I would never be able to eat again, and must eat so as to reduce to silence this world rioting so noisily around me, and I would never be able to do so. But the greatest noise of all came from my own belly. I often laid my ear against it with startled eyes, for I could hardly believe what I heard. And now that things were becoming unendurable, my very nature seemed to be seized by the general frenzy and made senseless attempts to save itself. The smell of food began to assail me, delicious dainties that I had long since forgotten, delights of my childhood. Yes, I could smell the very fragrance of my mother's teats. I forgot my resolution to resist all smells, or rather, I did not forget it. I dragged myself to and fro, never more than a few yards, and sniffed as if that were in accordance with my resolution, as if I were looking for food simply to be on my guard against it. The fact that I found nothing did not disappoint me. The food must be there, only it was always a few steps away. My legs failed me before I could reach it. But simultaneously I knew that nothing was there, and that I made those feeble movements simply out of fear, lest I might collapse in this place and never be able to leave it. My last hopes, my last dreams, vanished. I would perish here miserably. Of what use were my researches, childish attempts undertaken in childish and far happier days, here and now was the hour of deadly earnest. Here my inquiries should have shown their value, but where had they vanished? Only a dog lay here, helplessly snapping at the empty air, a dog who, though he still watered the ground with convulsive haste at short intervals and without being aware of it, could not remember even the shortest of the countless incantations stored in his memory, not even the little rhyme which the newly born puppy says when it snuggles under its mother. It seemed to me as if I were separated from all my fellows not by a quite short stretch, but by an infinite distance, and as if I would die less of hunger than of neglect. For it was clear that nobody troubled about me, nobody beneath the earth, on it or above it. I was dying of their indifference. They said indifferently, he is dying, and it would actually come to pass. And, I d and did I not myself assent? Did I not say the same thing? Had I not wanted to be forsaken like this? Yes, brothers, but not so much as to perish in that place, but to achieve truth and escape from this world of falsehood where there is no one from whom you can learn the truth, not even from me, born as I am, a citizen of falsehood. Perhaps the truth was not so very far off, and I not so forsaken, therefore, as I thought, or I may have been forsaken less by my fellows than by myself in yielding and consenting to die. But one does not die so easily as a nervous dog imagines. I merely fainted, and when I came to and raised my eyes, a strange hound was standing before me. I did not feel hungry, but rather filled with strength, and my limbs, it seemed to me, were light and agile, though I made no attempt to prove this by getting to my feet. My visual faculties in themselves were no keener than usual. A beautiful, but not at all extraordinary hound stood before me. I could see that, and that was all. And yet it seemed to me that I saw something more in him. There was blood under me. At first I took it for food, but I recognized it immediately as blood that I had vomited. I turned my eyes from it to the strange hound. He was lean, long-legged, brown, with a patch of white here and there, and had a fine, strong, piercing glance. What are you doing here? he asked. You must leave this place. I can't leave it just now, I said without trying to explain, for how could I explain everything to him? Besides, he seemed to be in a hurry. Please go away, he said, impatiently lifting his feet and setting them down again. Let me be, I said. Leave me to myself, and don't worry about me. The others don't. I ask you to go for your own sake, he said. You can ask for any reason you like, I replied. I can't go even if I wanted to. You need have no fear of that he said, smiling. You can go all right. It's because you seem to be feeble that I ask you to go now, and you can go slowly if you like. If you linger now, you'll have to race off later on. That's my affair, I replied. It's mine too, he said, saddened by my stubbornness, yet obviously resolved to let me lie for the time being, but at the same time to seize the opportunity of paying court to me. At another time, I would gladly have submitted to the blandishment of such a beautiful creature, but at that moment, why, I cannot tell, the thought filled me with terror. Get out, I screamed, and all the louder, as I had no other means of protecting myself. All right, I'll leave you then, he said, slowly retreating.
You're wonderful. Don't I please you? You'll please me by going away and leaving me in peace, I said. But I was no longer so sure of myself as I tried to make him think. My senses, sharpened by fasting, suddenly seemed to see or hear something about him. It was just beginning. It was growing. It came nearer. And I knew that this hound had the power to drive me away, even if I could not imagine to myself at the moment how I was ever to get to my feet, and I gazed at him. He had merely shaken his head sadly at my rough answer, with ever-mounting desire. Who are you? I asked. I'm a hunter, he replied. And why won't you let me lie here? I asked. You disturb me, he said. I can't hunt w while you're here. Try, I said. Perhaps you'll be able to hunt after all. No, he said. I'm sorry, but you must go. Don't hunt for this one day, I implored him. No, he said. I must hunt. I must go. You must hunt, I said. Nothing but musts. Can you explain to me why we must? No, he replied. But there's nothing that needs to be explained. These are natural, self-evident things. Not quite so self-evident as all that, I said. You're sorry that you must drive me away, and yet you do it. That's so, he replied. That's so. I echoed him crossly. That isn't an answer. Which sacrifice would you rather make to give up your hunting or give up driving me away? To give up my hunting, he said without hesitation. There, said I. Don't you see that you're contradicting yourself? How am I contradicting myself, he replied. My dear little dog, can it be that you really don't understand that I must? Don't you understand the most self-evident fact? I made no answer. For I noticed, and new life ran through me, life such as terror gives, I noticed from almost invisible indications, which, pro which perhaps nobody but myself could have noticed, that in the depths of his chest the hound was preparing to upraise a song. You're going to sing, I said. Yes, he replied gravely. I'm going to sing soon, but not yet. You're beginning already. I said, no, he said, not yet, but be prepared. I can hear it already, though you deny it, I said, trembling. He was silent. And then I thought I saw something such as no dog before me had ever seen. At least there was no slightest hint of it in our tradition. And I hastily bowed my head in infinite fear and shame in the pool of blood lying before me. I thought I saw the hound was already singing without knowing it, nay, more, that the melody separated from him was floating on the air in accordance with its own laws, and as though he had no part in it, was moving towards me, towards me alone. Today, of course, I deny the validity of all such perceptions and ascribe them to my overexcitation at the time. But even if it was an error, it had nevertheless a sort of grandeur and is the soul, even if delusive reality, that I have carried over into this world from my period of fasting, and shows at least how far we can go when we are beyond ourselves. And I was actually quite beyond myself. In ordinary circumstances, I would have been very ill, incapable of moving, but the melody, which the hound soon, soon seemed to acknowledge as his, was quite irresistible. It grew stronger and stronger. Its waxing power seemed to have no limits, and already almost burst my eardrums. But... The worst was that it seemed to exist solely for my sake. This voice before whose sublimity the, wo the woods fell silent to exist solely for my sake. Who was I that I could dare remain here? Lying brazenly before it in my pool of blood and filth, I tottered to my feet and looked down at myself. This wretched body can never run. I still had time to think, but already spurred on by the melody, I was careening from the spot in splendid style. I said nothing to my friends. Probably I could have told them all when I first arrived, but I was too feeble. And later it seemed to me that such things could not be told. Hints, which I could not refrain from occasionally dropping, were 
quite lost in the general conversation. For the rest, I recovered physically in a few hours, but spiritually, I still suffer from the effects of that experiment. Nevertheless, I next carried my researches into music. True, science had not been idle in this sphere either. The science of music, if I am correctly informed, is perhaps still more comprehensive than that of nurture and in any case established on a firmer basis. That may be explained by the fact that this province admits of more objective inquiry than the other, and its knowledge is more a matter of pure observation and systematization, systematization, while in the province of food, the main object is to achieve practical results. That is the reason why the science of music is accorded greater esteem than that of nurture, but also why the former has never been penetrated so deeply into the life of the people has never penetrated so deeply into the life of the people. I myself felt less attracted to the science of music than to any other until I heard that voice in the forest. My experience with the musical dogs had indeed drawn my attention to music, but I was still too young at that time, nor is it by any means easy even to come to grips with that science. It is regarded as very esoteric and politely excludes the crowd. Besides, although what struck me as most deep struck me most deeply as at first about these dogs was their music their silence seemed to me still more significant and as for their frightening affrighting music probably it was quite unique so that i could leave it with uh, leave it out of the count but thenceforth their silence confronted me everywhere and in all the dogs i met so for penetrating into real dog nature research into food seemed to me the best method calculated to lead me to my goal by the straightest path. Perhaps I was mistaken. A border region between these two sciences, however, had already attracted my attention. I mean the theory of incantation by which food is called down. Here again, it is very much against me that I have never seriously tackled the science of music and in this sphere cannot even count myself among the half-educated, the class on whom science looks down most of all. <clears throat> this fact I cannot get away from. I could not, I have proof of that, unfortunately, I could not pass even the most elementary scientific examination set by an authority on the subject. Of course, quite apart from the circumstances already mentioned, the reason for that can be found in my incapacity for scientific investigation, my limited powers of thought, my bad memory, but above all, in my inability to keep my scientific aim continuously before my eyes. All this I frankly admit, even with a certain degree of pleasure, for the profound cause of my scientific incapacity seems to me to be an instinct, and indeed by no means a bad one. If I wanted to brag, I might say that it was this very instinct that invalidated my scientific capacities, for it would surely be a very extraordinary thing if one who shows a tolerable degree of intelligence in dealing with the ordinary daily business of life, which certainly cannot be called simple, and moreover one whose findings have been checked and verified, where that was possible, by an individual, by individual scientists, if not by science itself, should a, should a priori be incapable of planting his paw even on the first rung of the ladder of science. It was this instinct that made me, and perhaps for the sake of science itself, but a different science from that of today, an ultimate science, prize freedom higher than everything else. Freedom. Certainly, such freedom as is possible today is a wretched business. But nevertheless, freedom, nevertheless, a possession. That was Investigations of a Dog, one of the selected stories of Franz Kafka. I have been reading out loud for two hours and 48 minutes. I'm surprised at myself, but I did not expect that last story to be so very long. Investigations of a Dog was a full, um, good lord, that was from page 202 to page 255, wow, and I started with a commonplace confusion. So I read you this much book today, is that enough book? Not, not for the hungry mind, not when the next story is another 30, 40 pages. All right, that'll have to wait for another time. Good evening, all, some or none. Have a good night. Franz Kafka wrote 
words. I read them. That's all that can be said. Thank you for listening. The next one is called The Burrow. Sounds exciting. Mm-hmm. <laughs>